Good morning and welcome to the third meeting of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee of 2021. Uh, we turn now to item one on the agenda, which is the Heat Networks Scotland Bill, and the committee is considering this bill at stage two. So we have with us today uh, the Minister for Energy Connectivity in the Islands, Paul uh, Wheelhouse, and also his uh, officials will be assisting him. So we will start straight off with item one and the, the bill, and we will go first of all to amendment one to the Heat Network Scotland bill, and I will call amendment one in the name of the minister, which is in a group on its own, the minister to move and speak to amendment one, Mr. Minister. Thank, thank you very much, convener, and good morning to you and committee members. Convener, as introduced, uh, section one, subsection seven of the bill enables the Scottish ministers to modify the meanings of heat network, uh, district heat network, and communal heating system. And this is necessary so that any technological changes that occur in future can be taken account of without the need for primary legislation. <clears throat> the Law Society of Scotland appeared to agree with this view in stage one evidence, considering the definition sufficiently neutral to address a variety of heat networks, while also noting, I uh, quote here, secondary legislation is probably the only way to retain the level of flexibility required to adapt quickly to future markets, given the constraints on parliamentary time, unquote. We did, however, hear evidence from witnesses at stage one <clears throat> who were concerned that so-called ambient or fifth generation or shared loop systems were not captured by the definitions in section one, and therefore not subject to regulation by the provisions of the bill now or in the future. Um, I believe that it would be prudent to add thermal energy, uh, quote unquote, uh, to the terms uh, whose meaning may be modified by the regulations under uh, section one, subsection seven. So, convener, this is what amendment one would do, and I believe this is uh, necessary in order to maximise the flexibility that future administrations will have to apply, or indeed disapply, the regulatory requirements that the rest of the bill creates, as may be appropriate in time. So, I trust that committee members will be sympathetic to this. Future proofing the bill in this way, and I note that regulations under section one, subsection seven, are subject to the affirmative procedure, uh, thereby ensuring that Parliament will have maximum scrutiny should this power need to be used in the future. Uh, I move Amendment One, Convener. Um, thank you, Minister. And as no member of the committee is asked to uh, speak on this particular amendment, the question is that Amendment One be agreed to. Are we all agreed? If any are disagreed. Type N in the chat box now. Um, we are all agreed. So the question now is that sections two, three, and four be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. So we now move on to next grouping. Uh, which is on fuel poverty, contributing to fuel poverty targets and considering Scottish fuel poverty advisory panel. So I will call amendment two in the name of the minister grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Minister to move amendment two and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. Um, this group of amendments seeks to meet the recommendations in paragraph 131 and 132 of the committee stage one report, which invited me to reflect on the evidence of fuel, on fuel poverty, discuss further with the Scottish Fuel Poverty Partnership Forum, and bring forward a proposal for how best to address the policy imperative of fuel poverty within the Bill. The report also asked me to consider where the recognition of fuel poverty within the Bill would create most impact. I am today presenting several amendments which would embed the issue of fuel poverty throughout the Bill, uh, given the importance that the Scottish Government, the Committee, uh, and above all, those in fuel poverty have placed on tackling this issue. Amendment three would amend section five of the bill so that when assessing an application for a heat network's license, the licensing authority must consider the applicant's ability to operate heat networks in a way that contributes uh, to Scotland's fuel poverty targets. In doing so, we would be making clear to the licensing authority and to operators themselves that fuel poverty is to be of equal importance to emissions reductions, which are already specified as a con consideration in section five. In practice, the requirement to operate a heat network in a way which contributes to the fuel poverty targets could be evidenced in a number of ways which address the four drivers 
of fuel poverty. For example, a special tariff uh, for those in fuel poverty, a wider service providing energy efficiency installations, or the provision of advice on the use of the system, or indeed home energy use more, more broadly. Amendment 2 is technical drafting change to accommodate Amendment 3. And amendments 50 and 66 would require Scottish ministers to consult the Fuel Poverty uh, Advisory Panel in the development of regulations, making provision about the making and determination of applications relating to heat network consent and on guidance relating to the designation and variation of heat network zones by local authorities. This is a recognition that while fuel poverty has been of the utmost priority for the Scottish Government and of the members of the Scottish Parliament more widely, the panel exists in statute to bring the public, private and third sectors together to understand the issues facing those in fuel poverty in Scotland and to advise on potential policy changes that are required. By involving the panel in the development of the regulations and the guidance, I believe that the panel can help to ensure that new heat networks in Scotland are designed with those in fuel poverty in mind from the outset. Convener Amendments 50 and 66 would also require the Scottish Ministers to consult local authorities in the development of the regulations in Section 27 and guidance in Section 45. I believe that this is right, uh, given that the Bill is introduced and amendments that have been lodged, which we will come to later, create the potential for local authorities to have the responsibility for designating heat network zones and determining heat network consents, and it is important that they are assured of their involvement in designing the functions that they may become responsible for. Amendment 64 seeks to reflect the fuel poverty imper imperative in Part 3 of the Bill by providing that, in considering whether to designate a heat network zone, a local authority or the Scottish ministers must have regard to the potential for a heat network in the area to contribute to meeting fuel poverty targets. These zones will have the potential to carry real consequence, taken with the provision for permits under Part 4 of the Bill, and with the potential for their delivery to be supported by obligations on non-domestic building, uh, building owners under powers in the Climate Change Scotland Act 2009 and the Non-Domestic Rates Scotland Act 2020, which we have committed to consulting on later this year as part of our Climate Change Plan update. It is important then that they are underpinned by public consultation, as Section 39 of the Bill already provides for, and by extensive analysis. Section 39 specifies a number of the matters that local authorities and the Scottish Ministers under Section Sections 40 and 44 must consider in determining whether to designate an area as a heat network zone. These include the availability of waste heat or renewable generation sources, the presence of anchor buildings, and the information contained in any building assessment reports undertaken under Section 54. As set out in the policy memorandum, the Scottish Government is seeking to contribute to eradicating fuel poverty as part of the Bill by ensuring that new heat networks develop where evidence shows that they can reduce fuel costs for householders and businesses. It has been my intention to deliver this uh, on this uh, by specifying fuel poverty as a matter to be considered in the designation of heat network zones under the regulation making powers at section 39, subsection 1, uh, part E. Indeed, our partners at uh, Zero Waste Scotland uh, are currently developing a first draft of the method that may be used to designate heat network zones. And fuel poverty is a major criteria uh, criterion in evaluating projects under this method. However, on reflection, it would clearly provide greater reassurance if this requirement was specified on the face of the bill. So, Amendment 65 makes a consequential change as a result of Amendment 66. Finally, convener, Amendments 132 and 133 are consequential on Amendments 3, 50, 64, and 66, inserting necessary definitions of fuel poverty targets and the Scottish Fuel Poverty Advisory Panel into the interpretation section for the Bill, and I urge members to support each of my amendments in this group. Convener, I move Amendment 2. Thank you, Minister. Um, before we uh, bring in some members on this amendment, uh, there is a question I should ask, and the question is that Section 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Now, I bring in Graham Simpson on the Fuel Poverty Amendment grouping. Graham Simpson. Yeah, thanks very much, convener. And uh, can I just say at the outset that I welcome the comments from the minister. Um, a lot of that sounded quite technical, but in essence, it's really quite simple. Um, and it is that we t have regard to fuel poverty and ensure that when we have a district heating network, 
that uh, it delivers on fuel poverty targets. And you might think, well, that's all quite obvious. Of course, that's what it does. Uh, but I think unless it is stated in law, then uh, the, there is a danger that that could slip. So um, I do welcome uh, the minister's uh, amendments here. I think they're very useful. Uh, and as someone um, who actually worked on the fuel poverty bill, uh, I'm really pleased to see that, that it also mentions the Scottish Fuel Poverty Advisory Panel. Uh, I think that's really important. So all in all, I think these are a, a positive uh, amendments and one, ones that I could support. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. And Alex Rowley would like to come in. Convener, thank you. And likewise, um, as we sit here this morning, a cold January morning, it is tragic that there are thousands of people all over Scotland that will be cold, that will be living in fuel poverty. Um, I don't believe the government's fuel poverty bill is ambitious enough, and, and, and argued that case with members of the local government committee, including Mr. Simpson. Um, but nevertheless, we need to tackle fuel poverty, and that's why it's crucial that, that these amendments have come forward. I'm grateful the minister has listened to the committee and to many others who want to see the eradication of fuel poverty in Scotland, and, and I will certainly be supporting these amendments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Richard Lyle. Thank you, Kandina. I totally agree with my colleagues. Uh, fuel poverty is uh, something that we all have to care about, and we all have to take time to try and uh, resolve. And uh, maybe the UK government could look at uh, why people in certain areas don't get uh, uh, money for uh, to help with their fuel poverty when certain postcodes get it and other postcodes don't. Thank you. Minister, to wind up. Thank you, Convener. Can I just thank members uh, for their positive remarks and, indeed, uh, thank the committee, because I think the committee itself uh, and those witnesses who gave evidence to the committee have, have hopefully helped us strengthen the, the, the uh, clarity and um, explicit nature of the references to fuel poverty, because I think it is, as from the outset, been one of the underpinning priorities in creating this bill. Um, but I think uh, the committee has helped to strengthen the bill here, and I'm very grateful to it and, and uh, its members, and indeed the witnesses who, who supported the work of the committee in preparing its report. Thank you. Um, thank you, Minister. The question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? As we are agreed, I will now call Amendment 3 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 2. The Minister to move formally. Formally moved, Convener. The question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? All agreed? And I now call Amendment 145 in the name of Claudia Beamish, which is grouped with Amendments 149 and 152 on the Just Transition Principles. And Alex Rowley is to move Amendment 145 and speak to all amendments in the group. Alex Rowley. Convener, my understanding is that the, um, my colleague Claudia Beamish has had discussions with the Minister, and that as a result of those discussions, there is an intention to bring something forward at stage three around the just transition principles, and therefore. I would uh, intend to withdraw the uh, Amendment 145 in the name of Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rowley. Does any member object to the amendment being withdrawn? Uh, no member objects. So that, uh, well, sorry, Graham Simpson wishes to speak. A point of clarification is uh, Alex Rowley also is is he withdrawing all three amendments? Mr. Rowley, group? are you withdrawing all three amendments at this stage? Well, if that's the way to do it, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm happy for it to be done that way. I think that's that's fine. Um, does any member object to Mr. Rowley withdrawing those three amendments? There's no objection, so. The uh, amendment is withdrawn. Uh, 
I now come to the section on heat networks licenses standard conditions, and I call amendment 134 in the name of Alexander Burnett, which is in a group on its own. Um, Alexander Burnett to move and speak to amendment 134. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you very much, convener. Uh, now, before I begin speaking to the amendments today, uh, can I please note members to my register of interest, uh, particularly in relation to my involvement in developing Scotland's one well, of Scotland's first district heating networks, which I began in 2004. Uh, I said previously at stage one that I very much welcome the ability to deliberate this legislation uh, to advance heat networks in Scotland, uh, and I'm pleased to see the principle of this bill uh, aims to encourage greater use of heat networks. Um, though I do have some concerns uh, whether some amendments will actually achieve that, uh, but I will get to those points uh, accordingly. Um, now, for the amendment itself uh, you know, and why, why it's needed, um, you know, what we're looking at is uh, you know, when setting up a regulation body agreement, you know, the agreement should include service standards that clearly establish communication protocols uh, and decision-making timescales uh, that ensure regulatory process is conducted in a timely uh, and transparent manner. Um, you know, the Scottish Government needs to fully determine how this bill is going to be regulated uh, and what role Ofgem play in this, uh, whether it's license authority, um, and they must be agile, whoever it is, must be agile and responsive, responsive uh, and clarity uh, is therefore needed uh, in, in regulating uh, that policy in the devolved Scottish context. Uh, so all of this, you know, this clarity uh, would ensure that heat networks uh, will be effectively deployed uh, within the devolved powers of the Scottish Government. Uh, and by doing all this, uh, it will then uh, make sure that heat networks make progress uh, towards the Scottish Government's net zero target, uh, ensuring Scotland's future heating needs are met by low carbon energy. Now, uh, uh, with the uh, actual working of the amendment, uh, you know, the, the clerks have uh, interpreted that as a, as a reference uh, to the regulation body agreement, to, to, the, uh, to the licensing regime, uh, to uh, look at how heat networks are regulated, uh, and the draft amendment uh, aims at including certain provisions within the standard conditions for a heat networks license, so that the service standards, communication, uh, and decision-making protocols are clearly set out uh, for all involved uh, in the sector. Uh, now, I, I'm very grateful uh, to, to, to the Minister uh, we, we, for, for, for discussion on all, all the amendments and all the bill uh, uh, throughout the passage so far. Uh, it's, uh, it's, um, it's been done in a most constructive uh, manner at all stages, uh, and, I, and I was grateful for the conversation uh, we had regarding my own amendment uh, and a couple of points that he, he's made. Uh, that means that I, I won't press my amendment at this stage, uh, but I will be uh, editing it and, and resubmitting uh, uh, amendments uh, in stage three uh, to correct that uh, and, and hopefully with, it, with his support again at that. Uh, the first uh, correction uh, that I think we would like to be seeing um, in, in working with, with the minister uh, is, in ter is in part of a definition uh, in, in part one and part two uh, of my amendment. Uh, we refer to the heat network operator, uh, which was uh, the way we drafted it with the clerks. Uh, that's been uh, pointed out that that definition doesn't actually exist within the legislation uh, and so might confuse, might cause some confusion uh, and we would look to uh, change that to a, to a definition that is understood by uh, you know, within the act uh, you know, something along the lines of being the license holder um, the I will probably look to, to split this amendment uh, back to stage three uh, as part three of my amendment. Uh, in terms of decision-making protocols to be agreed between the operator and the licensing authority uh, are maybe not quite as clear as, as we uh, intended. Uh, I appreciate that uh, in discussion with the minister that this would create a dilemma where if the license had been issued but, proto but protocols still had to be agreed, uh, what would that have on the impact and enforcement of the license? Uh, and uh, the, the, the intention of this part of the amendment uh, was that uh, you know, uh, uh, conversations, applications between in the actual making of the licensing uh, were done timiously, and it was protocols regarding uh, the timing 
uh, of that toing and froing between the operator and licensing authority uh, that I sought to address. Uh, and uh, with the clerks, we will look to uh, make that clearer uh, in, in stage three uh, when I'll bring forward another amendment uh, to that effect. Uh, and, and again, uh, in discussion with the minister, and as I said, uh, whose uh, uh, assistance in, in, in drafting in, in these amendments uh, has been much welcomed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burnett. Does the minister wish to say anything at this point? Uh, thank you, Kavina. Just to confirm, I mean, uh, Alexander Burnett has, has summed up the situation very well. I'm, I'm really pleased to, to work with him, and we will hopefully be able to work together with Mr. Burnett, Burnett to, to address the drafting issues he's referenced. And I agree with his uh, assessment of, of the difficulties with the drafting as they stand, but I welcome uh, Mr. Burnett's um, uh, decision not to move the amendments. I just want to put on the record I will uh, seek to work with him, and my officials will work with him to ensure we can address the very valid points he makes around trying to provide certainty uh, about the uh, timing and nature of what's to be exchanged between the, uh, the, the net heat network license holder and, and the licensing authority. So, uh, pleased to confirm to the committee that uh, I will work with Mr. Burnett to address the issues. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, Mr. Burnett, uh, formally ask you whether you wish to press or withdraw the amendment. Uh, yeah, I'll be uh, with, withdrawing the amendment uh, for the reasons below and looking to resubmit at stage three. Thank you. Then uh, there's two questions re with reference to previous amendments and this amendment. Uh, the question, first of all, is that section five be agreed to? And also then the question that section six be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're agreed on both of those. And I now come to minor and technical amendments as a grouping, and I would call Amendment 4 in the name of the Minister grouped with amendments as shown on the groupings. Minister to move Amendment 4 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, now I would like to turn, as, uh, as you said, to the grouping that relates to minor and technical amendments. These are largely relating to drafting changes following the review of the Bill and consequences of amendments discussed in remaining groupings. In addition, I would like to thank the Law Society of Scotland uh, for pointing out matters in relation to the heat network consents that require clarification that are also addressed by this grouping. Uh, to start with, Amendment 4 would make a technical change or te technical changes to the word order of Section 7, Subsection 4, Part B. There is no substantial effect uh, of this amendment. Amendment 7 corrects an omission to require li a licensing authority where one is designated under Section 4 of the Bill as an alternative to the Scottish Minister's. Uh, to have regard to any guidance issued by the Scottish Ministers under Section 14. This guidance is important as it can, for example, uh, provide general direction in terms of setting out processes of assessing the heat network licence applications. Amendment 8 is again a technical change in terms of wording of subsection 1 of Section 17 uh, to reflect that heat networks may be constructed or operated by another person on behalf of the consent holder. Uh, now I would like to turn to amendments that were inspired by the feedback provided by Law Society of Scotland in their written evidence in relation to the enforcement of heat network consents. Uh, we reflected on this uh, and amendments 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59 and 60 would amend sections 29 and 30 to recognise that a person may be exempt from the requirement to hold a heat network consent and clarifying that enforcement action cannot be taken in certain cases. Lastly, I would like to turn to Amendments 128 and 129 that aim to reflect the introduction of further regulation-making powers introduced by other Stage 2 amendments lodged by the Government in relation to appeals against revocation of heat networks licence, um, appeals against notice of revocation given by a local authority, uh, the call-in of heat network consent applications, uh, etc., by the Scottish Ministers, appeals regarding applications for heat network consent, etc., to local authorities, Applications and decisions under Part 2, where there is more than one appropriate consenting authority. Section 32, subsection 1, uh, appeals against revocation of heat network zone permits and uh, registration of network way leave rights. The, these powers allow the modification of primary legislation, and Amendments 128 and 129 provide for the application of the affirmative procedure where the regulations make textual modification of primary legislation. So, convener, I ask members to support each of the amendments in the group, and I move Amendment 4. 
Thank you, Minister. Uh, no member wishes to speak in this. So the question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're all agreed. And the question then is that Section 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? And then the question is that Sections 8, 9 and 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. So we move then on to Amendment Five, and this is the Heat Network's licenses, revocation, and appeals against revocation. And I call Amendment Five in the name of the Minister, group with Amendment Six. Minister to move Amendment Five and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Uh, the amendments which I have brought forward in this group seek to address the recommendation that the Committee gave to the Scottish Government in paragraph 84 of its report. Uh, the Committee asked the Scottish Government to reflect on for stage two whether there is scope to introduce an appeals process for heat networks licences. Uh, Convener, I agree that this is something that we can address at stage two today. It is, of course, important that businesses are treated fairly by the new regulatory system that the Bill would create. Amendment 5 would provide the Scottish Ministers with powers to amplify or expand on their procedural protections to be put in place before a licence could be revoked under Section 11. Section 11 already makes provisions about the revocation of a licence so as to provide a degree of certainty to licence holders that these cannot be revoked without good reason. However, without Amendment 5, any revocation process would be limited to what is provided for at Section 11. It is therefore thought necessary to have the flexibility to modify the revocations process, should that be thought necessary in future. It may, for example, uh, that, that other persons should be informed of the licensing authority's intention to revoke a licence, or that there should be a process set out for how representations are to be considered. In any event, the powers are there to ensure that any further procedural protections which are considered appropriate can be set out in legislation rather than simply being administrative arrangements. Amendment 6 would create a new power for the Scottish Ministers to create an appeals process against the revocation of heat networks licences. Um, th this is a broad power, I appreciate that, but subsection 2 provides examples of matters that these regulations and therefore such an appeals process could feature. These include who may appeal, why an appeal may be brought, how appeals are to be lodged, and the information that may be required, as well as how decisions are to be determined. These uh, regulations would also be able to specify who would hear appeals, and convener, it's our intention to use the powers under Section 4 <clears throat> to specify a body to act as the licensing authority under the Bill. <clears throat> this would mean that Scottish ministers would not be responsible for administering the licensing system and in turn create an opportunity for regulations to be laid under Amendment 6, with Scottish Ministers appropriately determining the merits of a decision to revoke a licence made by the licensing authority. And with broad consensus that Ofgem would be suited to this role, um, assurances um, are being sought from, uh, Scottish, uh, from UK Ministers, and this, as, as the committee may be aware, I request the UK Government for powers to amend Ofgem's role and the timescales for the necessary legislation uh, would, of course, be welcome. I place again on record our intention that Scottish Ministers would hear appeals about the revocation of heat networks licences by a third party licensing authority, but I offer those comments for clarity on the need for subsection 3. And I urge members to support each of the amendments in the group, and I move uh, Amendment 5. Thank you, Minister. Alexander Burnett wishes to come in at this point. Uh, thank you, Convener, and uh, thank you, uh, Minister, for, for, for that, these, these set of amendments. Um, it's, it's very much in tandem with the uh, amendment that I, I previously just spoke about, although we won't be pressing at this stage. Uh, and I think that one of the things the sector has been uh, looking for uh, has been clarity uh, around the process and procedures uh, of uh, not just of applications, but also to have a uh, a revocation and appeals appeals for an appeals against revocation process, uh, and so uh, I'm you know, grateful that the minister has uh, you know, you know, uh, listened to that uh, and addressed that by uh, uh, launching amendments to uh, improve uh, the procedure and process uh, for those involved, so they can see uh, where, where they stand uh, dur during a process. Uh, and I welcome that, and I would just ask that when uh, when this uh, uh, comes into play that the processes here are are taken uh, in like I say in tandem uh, with the process for application so that uh, there, there's, there's some consistency uh, between not just uh, applying for and being granted a license uh, but also uh, appealing uh, against any revocation. Thank you. 
Thank you, Minister to wind up. Thank you, Convener. I, I certainly welcome uh, Mr Burnett's comments there. I will certainly do what we can to address his, his final point there about uh, trying to work in, in tandem. Uh, I, will, I will certainly bear that in mind as we progress uh, the, uh, the, the, the regulations around the, the bill. Uh, again, thank him. It is welcome to have um, the, the experience that Mr Burnett has, obviously, as a developer of Heat Networks. It has been useful to have his insights to some of these issues and uh, look forward to uh, working with him and other colleagues in developing the secondary legislation that supports the bill. Should it pass? Thank you, Minister. The question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Um, we are all agreed. The question is that Section 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. So I would now call Amendment 6 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 5. Minister to move formally. Formally move, convener. Thank you, Minister. The question is that Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The question is that Sections 12 and 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. So I now call Amendment 7 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 4. Minister to move formally. Uh, move, Convener. Thank you, Minister. The question is that Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. So I now call Amendment uh, 146 in the name of Morris Golden. This is in the grouping Heat Networks licenses existing heat networks. So, Morris Golden to move Amendment 146 and speak to all amendments in the group, which includes Amendments 147 and 148. Mr. Golden. Uh, thank you, Convener. I would like to move Amendment 146. Amendment 146 addresses the obvious need for the government to deal with retrospective changes to existing heat networks. This is a particularly unclear area of discussion, given that there is no certainty on what retrospective changes will be existing heat networks. Will those networks require licences? Will consent be required in order to continue operating? As things stand, we simply do not know. At a practical level, that creates unnecessary confusion for network operators not to mention the potential extra burden of balancing two sets of operating requirements. Nor does it help to solidify renewable heat at a time when we are not just looking at our mid- and long-term net-zero goals, but seeking to kick-start and sustain a green recovery from the pandemic. As Scottish Renewables have pointed out, what we need to address this is a clear statement of intent from the Scottish Government as to how existing heat networks will be integrated alongside new ones. Providing that certainty is the key to fully integrating existing heat networks alongside new ones, making operations as smooth as possible and giving investors the incentive needed to involve themselves in the Scottish market over the long term all of which, in turn, drives forward the green recovery and low-carbon job creation we all want to see. Uh, amendments 147 and 148 are minor uh, technical amendments that aim to facilitate Amendment 146, which I have already addressed. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Mr Golden. Uh, Minister, do you wish to make comments on these amendments? Yes, please, Convener. And uh, Convener, the subject of uh, existing heat networks was obviously discussed at length during the scrutiny of this bill at stage one. In fact, I, I note that Mr. Golden rightly raised this during my own evidence session as well. Uh, but before a comment on the amendment itself, um, I would like to highlight that the licensing provisions in the bill, as introduced, did not differentiate between new and existing heat networks uh, for a reason. The provisions in the bill respond to the Competition and Market Authority's market study, which examined existing schemes and found that there were issues present that had to be addressed ahead of the expected growth of the sector. The bill uh, therefore provides for a framework that is applicable to all schemes, both new and existing, albeit with powers to tailor the requirements appropriately as a regulatory system is fully developed in secondary legislation. 
It's through this secondary legislation we would look to create exemptions and protections for existing heat networks as necessary. This approach also avoids preempting decisions by the UK government, which has indicated its intention to introduce consumer protection legislation for heat networks, uh, which we expect will also apply to existing networks. Uh, we're still awaiting a response from the UK government on our proposal in relation to how best to address the consumer uh, protection provisions, and therefore it's uh, important we maintain flexibility in this bill so that, if passed, it's compatible with legislation introduced by the UK government on consumer protection. That being said, I do recognise that those who already operate a heat network in Scotland are looking uh, for information as to how the licensing regime may, may apply to them. And I note uh, Mr. Mr. Golden's uh, references to Scottish renewables concerned in, in this respect. Mr. Golden's uh, amendments 146, 147, and 148 uh, would do ju just that. And for this reason, I support the amendments in principle. However, regrettably, I do, ha however, have some concerns with the detail, specifically in terms of references to retrospective applications and in relation to the definition of uh, and what is an existing heat network. This means that I cannot, at this point in time, recommend that committee members support these uh, these particular amendments. In respect of references to retrospective applications, I should first note that this bill will not apply retrospectively. We are aware of several projects that are currently under development, but would not be operational before this bill obtains royal assent, assuming that it is passed. These types of projects would not, therefore, be covered under the proposed definition, and I trust that uh, that is not uh, Mr. Golden's intention. As well, um, the uh, amendment does not appear to recognise that heat network licences will be granted to organisations rather than specific projects. Therefore, referring to, uh, and I quote here, extensions of heat networks, uh, unquote, is not applicable in the context of the licensing system. That's why, if Mr. Golden will consider uh, not pressing his amendments at this time, I would be very happy to work with him with a view to him reintroducing them at stage three to ensure that we can take a account of existing heat networks in the context of the licensing system. So I would extend the offer to Mr. Golden, ask him not to press his amendments, but should the amendments be pressed, I urge members not to support amendments 146, 147, and 148 for the reasons I have given, even though I do agree with the principle underlying them. Um, Mr. Golden, do you wish to uh, wind up and or press or withdraw Amendment 146 and the other amendments in this group? Thank you, Convener, and I thank the Minister for his comments and the agreement in principle that we need an efficient and effective regulatory regime for existing heat networks. And I would like to take him up on his offer to work with me to ensure that at stage three, uh, the broad principles which Amendment 146, 147 and 148 uh, attempt to achieve can therefore be achieved at stage three. And on that basis, I am happy not to press 146, 147 and 148, convener. Um, so, Mr. Golden wishes to withdraw these amendments at this stage. Does any member of the committee object to that? There's no objection, so those amendments are withdrawn. Uh, the question is that section 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're all agreed. The question is that section 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're agreed, um, and I think I yes. Um, at this stage, I, I have to ask Mr. Golden if he wishes to move or not to move Amendment 148, already debated with Amendment 146. Not move. Thank you. Um, question is that Section 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're agreed. Um, and section 17, I call Amendment 8 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 4. Minister to move formally. Formally moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're all agreed. And I now come to call Amendment 9 in the name of the Minister. This is in a grouping. Uh, did local authorities heat network consent authority? So 
I call the amendments grouped with it. Uh, the minister to move amendment nine and to speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, convener. I apologise in advance. This is probably the lengthiest contribution I'll make in this uh, this debate. Um, uh, the amendments that I've lodged in this group are intended to meet the recommendation made by the committee in paragraph 136 of its report, which recommended that, in respect to heat network consents, that the bill provide for the balance of powers between ministers and local governments to be modified over time. Uh, convener, I've been happy to meet this recommendation. Members may be aware that when the idea of heat network consents was initially proposed, we suggested that local authorities would be well placed to take on this function, given their existing role as planning authorities and as heat networks are, are local assets by their nature. We moved away from this view following the findings of the independent analysis of the consultation, which found that some local authorities do not have the necessary resources to manage the consents process, and noted there were suggestions for a central body to issue and manage consents. In its recommendations uh, report of December 2019, the Heat Networks Regulation Working Group in May 2019, uh, which supported the drafting of the bill, commented that, and I quote here, uh, felt that the consenting proposal should be re reconsidered in order to reduce the burden on local, uh, both local authorities and to reduce the risk of local authorities effectively self-regulating. I also note that in my officials' engagement with COSLA counterparts prior to introduction, no objections were raised to the balance of responsibilities in part two of the bill relating to heat network consents. However, I believe that the committee's uh, recommendation and the amendments which I have lodged and will speak to represent a very sensible position for us to reach. They would enable those local authorities who wish to be empowered with this responsibility to become so, while ensuring that the Scottish Government can carry this function out elsewhere in Scotland, where that is the will of the relevant local authority. So I must apologise in advance for quite a few amendments to, to speak to here, Convener. Amendments, uh, uh, amendments 10 and 11 are those which would primarily give effect to the committee's recommendation by introducing the concept of a consenting authority that is responsible for the award of heat network consents in its area, uh, replacing the Scottish Minister's responsibility for that area. Firstly, Amendment 10 would create a power uh, the Scottish, for the Scottish Ministers to designate a local authority as the consent authority for its area. Subsection 3 uh, specifies that before doing so, the Scottish ministers must have consulted that local authority, as well as any other persons, as they consider, consider appropriate. And this, we feel, is important. Amendment 11 sets out the default position that the Scottish ministers act as the consent authority in those areas where the local authority in question has not been designated as a consent authority for its, its area. Uh, with these new powers available to lo those local authorities who would wish to have them, it is important that they are able to recover the costs incurred by them in exercising these new functions. Uh, accordingly, Amendments 124 and 125 would amend Section 77 of the Bill so that Scottish Ministers may make regulations about the payment of fees to local authorities for carrying out their functions under Part 2. Amendment 126 is a consequential amendment to Section 81, which provides that the new power to designate a local authority as a consent authority is subject to the affirmative procedure. Amendment 130 is a consequential amendment adding appropriate consent authority to the list of definitions in section 83. Amendments 12 to 31 and amendments 33 and 41 are consequential amendments as a result of the power to designate a local authority as a consent authority for its area. They replace the references to Scottish ministers with the appropriate consent authority and some grammatical changes uh, that arise as a result of that. While these are consequential amendments, they are important as they ensure that all the necessary powers under Part 2 in relation to consent are ex exercisable by the appropriate consent authority rather than the Scottish ministers. These powers combine to enable local authorities to perform the function of a consenting authority competently. Uh, convener Amendment 51 would deal with the possibility of joint working between local authorities. It is a broad power for the Scottish ministers by regulations to determine how applications for heat network consent are to be made and determined in the event that the proposed development does not uh, does sorry or, or may expand to cross local authority boundaries. <clears throat> it is necessarily broad, as it will be informed by engagement with the local authorities themselves to agree how such applications may be handled, and as the likely frequency of such applications will be not known until the designation of heat network zones under Part three of the Bill uh, is, uh, is undertaken. Nevertheless, uh, I believe it would be prudent to make such provision to future-proof the bill in anticipation of large-scale heat network developments in future, 
which would have the potential to span a number of areas. Without uh, prejudging the outcome of the analysis and public engagement, which will inform the designation of heat network zones, uh, we might, for example, do a development spanning Rutherglen and South Lanarkshire and adjacent areas within Glasgow. Uh, provision is already made for local authorities to work jointly in designating heat network zones under Section 43. Convener, there are also a, a number of consequences that would uh, result from the enablement of local authorities to act as consenting authorities, which Amendments 9, 36, 37, 38, 61, 62, and 133 deal with. Firstly, Amendment 36 would provide Scottish ministers with the power to call in applications for heat network consents. This is uh, similar to powers currently provided for under Section 46 of the Town and Country Planning Act, uh, Scotland Act. Uh, 1997, which allows the Scottish ministers to direct that a particular application or class of application be referred to them for decision. This is thought necessary to cover the potential that such a decision may affect matters of national importance. So that the Scottish ministers can make effective use of this power, Amendment 37 would then provide the Scottish ministers with powers, for example, to restrict local authorities from determining those applications for a period of time to direct local authorities to provide information on applications, or to include specified conditions when granting such applications. The intentions of the obtention of these powers is to provide Scottish ministers with the time and information necessary to determine whether or not to call in an application under Amendment 36. Convener, a further consequence of the designation of local authorities as consenting authorities is that it would allow the Scottish ministers to hear appeals against any decision by a local authority to decline an application for consent. <clears throat> Amendment 38 uh, creates powers for the Scottish Ministers by regulations to establish an appeals process in respect of decisions made by a local authority heat network consent applications or, or, or modifications. And this amendment is proposed in line with uh, the evidence heard in Stage 1 and noted uh, in the Committee Stage 1 report that the Scottish Government should reflect on the appeals processes within the Bill. Uh, those recommendations were primarily in respect uh, to the revocation of heat network licences and heat network consents, but I trust the committee agrees that it would follow that uh, an opportunity should be provided to appeal regarding the initial decision to award a heat network consent where it's possible. And amendments 61 and 62 are consequential changes needed so that Dean Planning Commission under Section 35 may be provided or amended if ministers award heat network consent, uh, a consent or modify it following a successful appeal. Amendments 9 and 133 are also consequential to Amendment 38. They adjust references to heat network consent, recognising that it may be granted on appeal. Uh, a convener Amendment 63 creates a new power for the Scottish Ministers to streamline the process for applications to a local authority, where applications for both a heat network consent and planning permission would, be re would require to be made to the local authority. The purpose of this is to simplify the administrative burden on local authorities and heat network uh, operators and developers, so that we can move new schemes to construction as quickly as possible, subject to appropriate scrutiny in response to the global climate emergency. Convener, I believe that these amendments combine to provide a pragmatic solution to the question of the role of local authorities that has rightly been raised in scrutiny of this bill. Uh, turning now to Andy Whiteman's alternative amendments 135, 136, 137, 150, 144 and 157, which, in summary, dictate that local authorities will become responsible for heat network consents in perpetuity within five years. Uh, I have sympathy with the principle of Andy Whiteman's amendments, in that I agree that, as far as possible, local authorities should be empowered as the decision makers on local matters. In this specific case, though, I believe that the amendments that I have brought forward and which the Committee's report led us towards are the most suitable approach. There are several reasons for this, uh, not least a lack of clear indication from local authorities themselves that they want these f functions imposed on them. Uh, firstly, at this point in time, we simply do not know where and the extent to which we will see heat network developments take place across Scotland. We do know, though, that it will not take place uniformly. Uh, that is, that is uh, certainly uh, our view. The viability of heat networks uh, is dependent on having sufficient heat density and interested customers. And the designation of heat network zones will clarify where heat network developments are most likely to take place, and this, in turn, will likely weigh heavily in local authorities' views on whether it would, uh, each local authority would wish to become a consenting authority. 
We are making progress in developing a method for designating heat network zones, and in our heat and building strategy, we will commit to producing a heat network's investment prospectus during 2021, which will include a first pass of heat network opportunities across Scotland that we and local authorities can subsequently build on. Ahead of this, though, I am very reluctant to require local authorities to invest in developing a consenting function when there is the very real chance that evidence will show that, for some, uh, this investment will go underutilised, as there will be few, if any, networks to consider. Secondly, while we have worked to estimate the cost of heat network consent functions as part of the financial memorandum which accompanied the bill, I am aware that these costs will necessarily increase with the creation of up to 32 con- consenting authorities. I am sure that members will agree that it is important that, uh, that, that, then, that we work with local authorities and COSLA uh, to come to a definitive view on the estimated costs and to agree the resources that need to be put in place to enable local authorities to take on this uh, very important function. The amendments I have lodged would allow a period for these discussions to take place before any regulations are laid, uh, whereas I am concerned that amendments which would specify local authorities as consent authorities by default would put local authorities at risk of being made to fulfil this function without assurances being put in place about adequate support. Thirdly, I would note that a 2020 report by Energy Saving Trust Networks found that, as heat networks are not a common technology in Scotland, there are gaps in skills within local authorities when it comes to district and communal heating. I would be keen that we work with local authorities to build capacity in the lead-up to the laying of regulations which would make them uh, consenting authorities, so that those who do wish to do so are well placed and the need for procured consultants and indeed the associated costs are minimised. If we do not, and if we make local authorities a consenting authority by default, then with, uh, this, with skills in this area being scarce at this time, costs may be further increased by local authorities competing to source appropriate staff. Fourthly, I am aware that there are likely to be local authorities who are undecided or indeed unaware about the potential for them to become consenting authorities uh, without consultation um, uh, uh, at this particular time. And maybe these local authorities would wish a period of time to consider this possibility if the function were to be undertaken by the Scottish Government's existing energy consent unit on behalf of those local authorities in the meantime, in a similar way to Norway's initial uh, national approach then these local authorities would have the opportunity to have witnessed the function in action uh, before coming to a more informed decision as to whether they would wish to act as the consenting authority for their area. Finally, uh, there are several technical and drafting issues with Mr Whiteman's amendments in their current form. For example, and for, for instance, there is no provision for the role of a consenting authority uh, to automatically transfer back to Scottish ministers in future should a local authority want uh, to do this. And what about heat networks that cross local authority boundaries, as there appears to be no provision for local authorities to work together? The, amend- the amendments also make no provision for how Part 7, in relation to the very important provision of transfer schemes, is to operate if the consent functions are to transfer to local authorities by default. And I would also be very concerned by Sections 19 to 24 and Section 35 of the Bill being commenced upon, immediately upon royal assent given that we and networks under development are not prepared for sudden implementation, and that part would not be con- uh, commenced coherently. The five-year period which uh, Mr Whiteman's amendments refer to could, however, help to overcome some of these issues I have raised and would provide this opportunity for us collectively to anticipate and adequately plan and resource for the deployment uh, of heat networks we, we can expect. In light of this, I would invite Mr Whiteman not to press amendments 135, 136, 137, 144, 150 and 157, and to work with me, together with COSLA, <coughs> to build on his amendments and uh, indeed my own amendments by inserting a clear trigger point or opt-in provision at stage three so that local authorities are empowered to take on this function should they wish to do so. I am very happy to offer my support to Mr Whiteman's amendments 138 and 139, though I would ask him uh, to withdraw amendment 140 which duplicates the effect of uh, part of Amendment uh, 50, which has already been agreed to. Amendment 50 requires the Scottish Ministers to consult not only local authorities in developing regulations under Section 27, but also the Scottish Fuel Poverty Advisory Panel alongside other appropriate persons. So, If pressed, um, I, I urge members not to support Andy Whiteman's amendments, um, just to reprise 135, 136, 137, 140, 144, 150 and 157, on the understanding and commitment that I have agreed that I and my officials will work with Mr Whiteman to bring back an alternative uh, set of amendments at stage three, 
I urge in, uh, members to instead to support my own amendments. That's nine uh, to thirty-one, thirty-three, thirty-six to thirty-eight, forty-one, fifty-one, sixty-one to sixty-three, one hundred twenty-four to one hundred twenty-six, one hundred thirty, and one hundred thirty-three, as well as to support Andy Whiteman's amendments one three eight and one three nine. I move amendment nine, Kabira. Thank you, <coughs> Minister. And I'll ask Graham Simpson to speak to Amendment 135 in the name of Andy Whiteman and other amendments in the group. Yeah, thanks very much, Convener. Um, I'm in the uh, slightly unusual position here of moving and speaking to amendments that are not in my name, but are in Andy Whiteman's name. And um, had these been my amendments, I would, of course, have been listening to the minister very carefully which i did um and and possibly re responding um to to that on the basis that they were my amendments so i'm having to uh, i find myself in a position of perhaps having to make an executive decision uh, on amendments that are not mine but let me first explain what the amendments do because andy whiteman um, has nine amendments in, in this group, um, and uh, the, the main one is Amendment 135. Now, the Danish experience was, um, I am told, an inspiration for this bill. In written evidence to the committee, the Danish Energy Agency noted that Denmark's 98 municipalities are responsible for heat planning and approval of heat projects and that two thirds of the pipe networks are owned by the municipalities. Um, in his stage one oral evidence to the committee on the 6th of October last year, the minister stated that, quote, we have not aimed to take a radically different approach from that taken in Denmark. The bill contains some 60 or so ministerial powers and only five powers in the hands of local authorities. In contrast to the Danish experience, the bill does indeed take a radically different approach by placing virtually all the powers in the hands of ministers and none in the hands of local authorities, uh, where they substantially rest in Denmark. Now, the committee's stage one report recommended that provisions should be introduced to the bill to allow for balance of powers between ministers and councils to be modified over time, and I welcome uh, the Minister's Amendment 10, which introduces a regulation making power to transfer the consent process to local authorities. But uh, I believe we should not rely on ministers using this power at some unspecified future date of their own choosing. Instead, the bill should make explicit provision for the consenting powers in Part 2 that currently sit with Scottish ministers to transfer by automatic force of law five years from the date of royal assent. Local authorities will have five years in which to decide how to administer these powers by themselves as part of a joint specialist unit or whatever. And that convener, in short, is what these amendments seek to achieve. So Amendment 135, as I said earlier, that's the substantive amendment transferring all consenting powers under sections 19 to 23, two local authorities, mm. five years after the date of royal assent. So that's quite a period of time. Amendment 136 is consequential. Mm. Amendment 137 provides the powers to revoke, revoke heat network consents to local authorities. Amendments 138, 139, and 140 mm. provide that ministers must consult local authorities before making regulations about how applications for consent are to be determined and how compensation provisions on modification or revocation are framed. Amendment 150 disapplies the deemed consent powers in section 35 after five years. Amendments 144 and 157 amend 80, section 84 on commencement and stipulate that all the previous amendments commence on the day of royal assent, giving effect to the trigger for the five-year period after which consenting powers go to local authorities. Um, so, 
Mr. Whiteman will be speaking today, would be inviting the committee to support all those amendments to properly reflect the minister's intentions not to take a radically different approach from Denmark. And, and I can see where he's coming from there. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll end it there, convener. And, and as I said at the start, I am having to make a decision for Andy Whiteman. And uh, I didn't hear anything from the minister that suggested that he's had any discussions with Mr. Whiteman. So I'm, I'm actually, uh, I feel I should help Mr. Whiteman perhaps get over the line with this um, and uh, accept the minister's offer to work with him. Um, I've no idea if Mr. Whiteman will be happy with that, but I feel knowing Mr. Whiteman, he probably will be. Um, so I'll take up the, the minister up on his offer to um, press, I think it was 138 and 139, uh, and not move the others in the group in Andy Whiteman's name. Um, and I'll just encourage the minister to pick up the phone to Mr. Whiteman as soon as he can. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Simpson. Now, Mr. Rowley would like to come in at this point. Yeah, I can be noted really just to say that I think Graham Simpson um, articulated very well uh, what, what Andy Whiteman's intentions are with these amendments. I'm happy to, to go along with what Graham Simpson said, but I think it would be important to signal to the minister that these are valid points that are being made and they're points that he needs to pick up with Mr Whiteman coming into stage three. Thank you. Thank you. And Minister to wind up. Thank you very much, Convener. I, I certainly would want to to kind of honour the, the kind of uh, spirit of the discussions we've just had uh, from Mr. Simpson and, and Mr. Riley. I appreciate it's a difficult situation, Mr. Whiteman not being present at the committee to, to for me to direct these points to him himself. I'm very grateful for the approach that Mr. Simpson has taken. I just want to reward the faith Mr. Simpson has put in uh, myself as minister in this process. Just to confirm, I will very much want to work with Mr. Whiteman to uh, address the legitimate issues he has raised. We, we are obviously um, supporting. Uh, the, the five-year period, which Mr. Whiteman's amendments uh, intended to uh, create, is, is a welcome development. We just believe there's a perhaps a better way we can work with Mr. Whiteman to put that into effect, and um, we think that the approach that Mr. Simpson has signalled will very much uh, help protect the integrity of, of what uh, we have sought to do in, in, a, in, in meeting the committee's request to work with uh, local authorities to be the consenting authority, but to do so in a way uh, which does not. Um, uh, see, uh, see uh, measures taking place immediately upon royal assent, which could call, be problematic. As I, I'll show, I not go through all the points I made previously, but just to confirm, I will work with Mr. Whiteman and my officials, and we will certainly be keen to do so. I know Mr. Whiteman is a very diligent member, and uh, we'll work closely with him to make sure that we will get um, uh, agreed wording that uh, we can support Mr. Whiteman's intent uh, at stage three. Uh, so I, I certainly uh, thank Mr. Simpson for his comments, and indeed Mr. Rowley, and just want to reassure them uh, that we will take the approach they have suggested. Thank you, Minister. The question then is that Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The question is that Section 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The question is that Section 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. So now call Amendment 10 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 9. Minister to move formally. On the move, Convener. The question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call Amendment 11 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 9. Uh, formally uh, Minister to move. Thank you, right. Minister. Sorry. The question is that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. And I would now call Amendment 12 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 9. Former move, Convener. Minister. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The question is that Section 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. 
Do I now call amendments 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 and 19, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated? And I invite the Minister to move the, these amendments 13 to 19 on block. Moved on block, convener. Sorry, Minister. Does any member object to a single question on each amendment individually? There's no objection. So uh, the question is, uh, I think the Minister's moved formally already. Yes, formally. Um, thank you. The question is, we're all agreed. The question is that section 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're all agreed. And I now call amendment 20 in the name of the minister already debated with amendment 9. Uh, minister to move formally. Formally move, convener. Thank you. The question is that amendment 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're all agreed. Call amendment 21 in the name of the minister already debated with amendment 9. Minister to move formally. Uh, formally move, convener. Thank you, Minister. The question is that Amendment 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The question is that Section uh, 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Um, call, I call Amendment 22 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 9. Minister to move formally. Uh, formally move, Convener. Thank you. Question is that Amendment 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Call Amendment 23 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 9. Minister to move formally. Call me move, Convener. Question is that Amendment 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call Amendment 24 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 9. Minister to move formally. Call me move, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. And the question is that Section 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. We move on to Section 23. I call Amendments 25, 26, 27, 28, 29 and 30, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. Does any member object to a single question being put? On amendments 25 to 30, no member object. So the question is that amendments 25 to 30 are to be agreed. I think the minister needs to move these formally on block. Moved on block, convener. Thank you. And the question is that amendments 25 to 30 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The question is that section 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're all agreed. So I now call Amendment 135 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 9, and Graham Simpson to move or not to move. Not moved. Um, in that case, does um, I think... Um, I'm not sure if there needs to be a formal withdrawal of that amendment or not, but does any member object to the amendment being withdrawn? No member objects, so that's fine. I call Amendment 136 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 9. Graeme Simpson to move or not to move? Not moved. Thank you. And the question is that uh, I call, sorry, I call Amendment now 31 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 9, Minister to move formally. A formally moved, Convener. Thank you. Um, question is that Amendment 31 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're all agreed. And I now call Amendment 32. So we move on to the next uh, grouping, and I call Amendment 32 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 34 and 35. Minister to move Amendment 32 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Minister. Thank you, Convener. Uh, these amendments which I have lodged uh, in this group are 
similar to those which are lodged in Group 4 in relation to appeals against the revocation of heat network licences. Members will recall that those amendments sought to address the Committee's recommendation to introduce the opportunity for licence holders to appeal in the event that their licence was revoked by the licensing authority. The Committee also noted that there may be scope to introduce an appeals process against the revocation of heat network consent. Uh, the Committee also asked the Scottish Government to further reflect on this and whether it was something that can be addressed at Stage 2. So, convener, in light of uh, the group we have just discussed in relation to local authorities as consenting authorities, I am happy to also move amendments which would create an opportunity for appeals against the revocation of consents by a local authority. The primary amendment uh, which would achieve this is Amendment 35. This amendment would, be, uh, would provide the opportunity for consent holders to appeal a proposed revocation uh, to the Scottish Ministers in the event that a local authority acting as a consenting authority gave notice of revocation of a consent. Subsection 5, Part B in Amendment 34 requires the notice of revocation to specify a date when revocation takes effect. This delay would allow time for an appeal to be made, and subsection 2 of the amendment ensures that consent is not revoked until the appeal has been heard. Of course, if the appeal is successful, the consent would not be revoked. Uh, subsection 4 specifies a number of matters that regulations which would create the appeals process might be expected to feature. Subsection 5 also enables these regulations to provide for inquiries or public hearings as part of the appeals process, should that be thought appropriate. In light of the Committee's views and appeals in relation to heat networks licences, I trust that members will welcome these proposed changes. Uh, I am sure that members will agree that it would be right and efficient that procedural protections are in place before a decision to revoke a consent is taken. And these procedures would allow the holder of a heat network consent to make their arguments uh, if faced uh, with a proposal to revoke uh, consent. During Stage 1 evidence, my officials and I spoke to the Committee about Section 24 of the Bill as introduced and noted that its broad nature could allow for a wide range of provisions to be made regarding the process involved in revoking a consent. On reflection, I would like to provide greater certainty to operators and developers in mind of the significant investment that is often involved by making clear provision, a clearer provision regarding the uh, procedural protections that they can expect before their right to operate their investment is revoked. Amendment 34 would do this by amending Section 24 uh, to require that notice must be given to consent holders about the intention to revoke a consent, that the reasons for this decision are specified, and that consent holders will have an opportunity to make representations against this decision. The, the ability for Scottish ministers to make further provision about the process for revoking heat network consents is retained in order to allow for any adaptations that may be needed in future. As well as increasing the fairness that the regulatory system provides for, this amendment would provide consistent, consistency with Section 11 of the Bill that's, uh, that is regarding the revocation of heat network licences. Amendment 32 is a consequential amendment which removes the ability for Scottish ministers to specify the manner in which heat network consents may be revoked, given that Amendment 34 makes provision in the Bill for giving, uh, noti giving of notice of proposed revocation and would confer power for regulations to specify additional procedures. Uh, I ask members to support each of the amendments in the group, and I move Amendment 32. Thank you, Minister. As no member wishes to speak on this group, the question is that Amendment 32 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 33 in the name of the Minister, uh, already debated with Amendment 9. A minister to move formally. Formally move, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 33 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call Amendment 34 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 32. Minister, to move formally. Ruth Convener. Thank you. Um, I think it's probably important just to verbally say that you move so that it's officially on the on the record, Minister. But, uh, but thank you. you. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so the question is that Amendment 34 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. And the question is that Section 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Um, I now call Amendments 35, 36, 37, and 38, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister 
uh, to move amendments 35 to 38 on block. I formally move convener. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 35 to 38? There is no objection. So the question is that amendments 35 to 30 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Um, I now call amendment 137 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with amendment 9. Graham Simpson to move or not move? That's uh, not moved. Thank you. And I then call Amendment 39 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 4. Minister, to move formally. Formally moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're all agreed. So I now call Amendment 138 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 9. Graham Simpson, to move or not move? And that one is moved. So 138 is moved. Uh, the question then is that Amendment 138 uh, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The question is now that Section 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Uh, I now call Amendment 40 in the name of the Minister grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Minister to move Amendment 40 and speak to all amendments in the group. Minister. Thank you, Convener. Uh, convener, the amendments I've lodged in this grouping are concerned with the processes for applying for and determining consent. Amendments 40, 42 and 43 allow the Scottish Ministers to introduce a clear pre-application requirement for developers to engage with local communities before seeking consent for a new development. Following very compelling evidence from uh, Citizens and Advice Scotland about the value that greater community engagement uh, could have in avoiding real consumer detriment that has emerged with a network in Glasgow, the committee asked me to, and I quote, um, reflect on this. Uh, the committee believed uh, that community engagement, that is, should not just be about online consultations or seeking views at the start of the process. It must be a matter of social licence, doing public confidence and putting the concerns of communities like the one in Glasgow at the very heart of the bill, unquote. Convener, I've been happy to accept this recommendation, and Amendment 40 is the primary amendment which gives effect to this. I would, it would enable Scottish ministers to require developers to include a community engagement report as part of an application relating to a heat network consent, and the Scottish ministers would be able to determine the types of application this requirement uh, would apply to. Where a report is required, the developer would be required to describe the community engagement it had undertaken in relation to the proposed application, now has taken account of any representations received by virtue of that engagement. By requiring such a condition, we can ensure the new networks are designed with their users in mind uh, and future-proof to avoid consumer detriment by considering the circumstances of the local community and to make any mitigations that may be appropriate. These provisions, therefore, provide a real opportunity to preempt the sort of problems which Citizens Advice Scotland rightly highlighted in their Stage 1 evidence which I have been working with my colleague Bob Doris, MSP, and the Local Citizens Advice Bureau and Home Energy Scotland to address. <clears throat> we have discussed the proposed amendment with Citizens Advice Scotland, who have indicated that they agree that community engagement provisions are best placed in Part 2 of the Bill, given that they relate most directly to new schemes and those which are most likely to be developed. We also note that our amendment meets the suggestion of Citizens Advice Scotland which in its pre-stage one debate briefing for MSP stated, and I quote here, um, regarding the incorporation of community engagement within the bill, it could be done in various ways, including mandating that developers or uh, suppliers provide evidence that they have sought the views of residents in the area and taken these into consideration. <clears throat> I draw to the committee's attention that the amendment does not make a community engagement report mandatory for all applications, as this will not always be appropriate. For instance, if the proposed heat network is to service an industrial estate or a new-built housing uh, estate, there may not be a community with which to engage. We will, of course, engage with Citizens Advice Scotland, uh, developers and others before making a, a determination under Section 26 of the Bill, but the intention behind these reports is that they will apply as widely as possible 
that engagement is intended to be undertaken with the community at large who may be affected, and not only those to whom it is or will be supplied. Convener, this brings me to Amendment 43, which creates a new section providing Scottish Ministers with the power to issue guidance in relation to the preparation of a community engagement report. The purpose of this section is to allow an opportunity to specify what co constitutes effective engagement, including who must be consulted, uh, while subsection 2, part B, makes clear that engagement will include consultation, it is clear that this is not only the only form of engagement which may be considered effective uh, for the purposes of evidencing the views of the local community. I will reaffirm the commitment I gave during the Stage 1 debate that the Scottish Government will work closely with Citizens Advice Scotland on the development of the guidance under this section, deliver on the Committee's view, which, which I share, uh, that this must be about more than consultation. I'm aware of the recent research which CAS itself has undertaken into community engagement for infrastructure projects, and I believe that we can build on this in the development of the guidance. Amendment 42 would make a consequential change to section 26, uh, subsection 4, so that the definition of a relevant application applies to the new section to be inserted by Amendment 43. Amendments 44 to 49 make a number of refinements to the provisions of the Bill which enable the Scottish Ministers to make regulations relating to heat network consents. Amendment 45 <clears throat> provides that the Scottish Ministers may, by regulations, make provision about the procedure to be followed in deciding on their own initiative to modify existing heat network consents. This will improve transparency in relation to such decision-making. Amendment 44 is a technical drafting change to accommodate Amendment 45. Amendment 46 it provides that the Scottish Ministers may, by regulations, make provision about the publication and notification of decisions <coughs> to modify heat network consents on their own initiative. Apologies, can we just take a wee sip of water? Um, uh, Amendment 47 is also a minor drafting change to reflect that Scottish Ministers may pro make provision about determining applications. Amendment 48 makes it clear that any regulations uh, making provision about the consideration of emissions reductions and fuel poverty may also apply in relation to decisions by the Scottish Ministers to modify heat network consent on their own initiative. Amendment 49 seeks to embed the Bill's twin objectives of fuel poverty alleviation and emissions reductions in the determination of new heat networks in the consenting system. By specifying these regulations may, in particular, make provision about the consideration to be given uh, to these matters in determining an application. I mean, the second subset of amendments in this grouping seek to embed the Bill's twin objectives of fuel poverty alleviation and emissions reductions in the determination of heat networks in the consenting system. So, convener, I ask members to support each of the amendments, uh, the amendments in the group, and I move Amendment 40 in my name. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Graham Simpson wishes to come in at this point. Yeah, thanks very much, convener. Um, so, I listened uh, with interest to the, the minister there. And I think this is a, an important set of amendments because consultation uh, is vital. But uh, just a word of caution to the minister, and I'm sure he knows this very well. We've seen in the planning system that where consultation exists, it is often a, a box-ticking exercise, um, and, and you know, and applicants can. Uh, you know, they can organise events that hardly anyone turns up to, but they can say that they've held the event uh, and there the box is ticked. And I think what we need to avoid here, and, and from what the minister says, I think he's uh, alive to this risk, uh, we, we need to avoid this kind of thing happening for, for heat networks. Um, I hear what he's saying about you don't need to have consultation in all areas. You know, if a heat network was on an industrial estate, there's nobody to consult with. Uh, so that's very sensible. But uh, I, I think it's just a word of caution that uh, when he introduces regulations, and regulations are the right way to do this, that they must pin things down so that any consultation is actually meaningful. Thank you, convener. Thank you. And uh, Minister, do you need to say anything further in response to that? To wind just up, convener, just to agree with Mr. Simpson that um, we obviously want any consultation to be meaningful, 
and uh, I very much take on board the points he, he makes. I think they're sensible comments, and uh, that certainly would be our intention to make sure that the guidance that's issued does make that consultation with communities and engagement with communities meaningful and uh, to achieve the end that he, he suggests. And uh, I very much agree with him. There is that risk we need to avoid. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 40 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're all agreed. Uh, I call Amendment 41 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 40. Minister to move formally. Formally move, convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 41 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call Amendment 139 in the name of Andy Whiteman already debated with Amendment 9. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 139 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call Amendment 42 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 40. Minister to move formally. Formally moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 42 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And the question is that Section 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Um, I call Amendment 43 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 40. Uh, minister to move formally. Formally moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 43 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're all agreed. Um, and I call Amendments 44, 45, 46, 47, 48. 49 and 50, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move Amendments 44 to 50 on block. Move on block, Convener. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 44 to 50? There's no objection. So the question is that Amendments 44 to 50 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I then call Amendment 140 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 9, Graham Simpson, to move or not move. Not moved. Thank you. And I call Amendment 149 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 145. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, not I, move. I, Amendment 149, and then Claudia Beamish already made Amendment 145. I think Alex Rowley has moved it. Um, not moved. Question, sorry, not moved. Beg your pardon, Mr. Rowley. Uh, so that amendment is not moved. Question is that Section 27 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Now, we... Um, I call Amendment then 51 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 9. Minister to move formally. Formally move, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 51 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. And the question is that Section 28 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Um, I then Call amendments 52, 53, and 54, all in the name of the Minister. And previously debated, I invite the Minister to move amendments 52 to 54 on block. Moved on block, Convener. <coughs> Thank you. Member object to those being moved on block. No member does. The question is that amendments 52 to 54 are agreed. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Question is that section 29 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call amendments 55, 56, 57, 58, and 59, all in the name of the minister and all previously debated. I invite the minister to move amendments 55 to 59 on block. I moved on block, convener. <clears throat> Thank you, minister. Any member object to those being put on block? A single question. No member objects. The question is that amendments 55 to 59 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The question is that section 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. 
The question is that section 31 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Um, I call amendment 60 in the name of the minister already debated with amendment four minister to move formally. Formally move convener. Thank you, minister. The question is that amendment 60 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The question is that section 32 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. And the question is that sections 33 and 34 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Um, as we've been proceeding for an hour and a half now, we will take a 10 minute break at that point. So I will suspend the meeting for 10 minutes and we will reconvene at 10.40. Thank you.
Welcome back to this meeting and we continue with the Heat Network Scotland Bill and considering the amendments at stage two. So I would now call Amendment 61 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 9. Minister to move formally. Formally move, convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 61 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Call Amendment 62 in the name of the Minister already debated. Minister to move formally. Formally move, convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 62 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call Amendment 150 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated, Graham Simpson, to move or not move. Not moved. Thank you. And the question is that Section 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call Amendment 63 in the name of the Minister already debated. Minister to move formally. Formally move, convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 63 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The question is that Section 36 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Now we come to the um, next grouping, which is uh, about designation of heat network zones by local authorities. So I call Amendment 151 in the name of Mark Ruskell in a group on its own. Mark Ruskell to move and speak to Amendment 151. Thanks very much, convener, and uh, happy to uh, move and speak to Amendment 151. Um, I think it's pretty clear that the designation of heat network zones has to happen if we're to get at least a fifth of homes and half of non-domestic buildings connected up as this bill aspires to do. Um, but I also know that the priority for councils is often quite understandably not what it would be nice to do, but what they are legally required to do. Uh, and clearly, you know, resourcing can be an issue here. It's already been brought up once this morning, and I'm sure the committee will return to it later on with Graham Simpson's amendment. But the will of councils to consider zones with regard to the process under Section 39 is not guaranteed under this bill as it stands. Uh, and my concern is that there may come a point, perhaps in a few years' time, when the scale and pace of change required on climate action means that we need to move a lot quicker and if heat network zones have not been delivered, then a vital piece of the jigsaw will be missing. And this could be the case in relation to changing climate change plans that may come in the midpoint of this decade, especially if hydrogen doesn't materialise in the gas grid. So the, the intention of this amendment is to keep the door open so that ministers could require that a council must deliver a heat network zone under certain conditions which could be specified by future regulation. Should those conditions as specified in any regulation then not arise, councils may continue to consider establishing zones under the provisions in Section 39. So essentially, convener, this amendment is about putting in place a backstop to require a rapid scale up if required. Thanks. Um, thank you. Uh Minister, would you wish to respond to this? If I may, convener, I'll, I'll keep my uh, comments in this group brief, though. Um, thank you for the opportunity. I, I understand the underlying intention of Amendment 151 is, as Mark Ruskell has just set out, to maximise the instances where heat network zones are designated, which will in turn, of course, help to grow the sector. So I, I very much acknowledge this is a well-intentioned uh, amendment. This is entirely in line with the objectives of the bill, and due to this, uh, I'm happy to support the amendment in principle. However, the amendment, uh, as, as it's currently drafted, is not easily reconciled with other sections of Part 3, um, specifically how the obligations on local authorities that are to be introduced by this amendment are to interact with discretionary powers contained in Section 38, uh, Subsection 3. And there's also the question of if and how uh, the duties in Section 39 to consider certain matters will apply in the context of a, an obligation to designate an area. This is because the amendment, um, at the same time as requiring local authorities to designate an area where it meets 
the conditions specified in regulations made by ministers uh, requires local authorities to consider the matters set out in Section 39. The inconsistencies between uh, the effect of this amendment and the existing provisions of Part 3 of the Bill would mean that, if this amendment were to be agreed to today, a number of amendments will be required at Stage 3 to address this conflict or other in, unintended uh, consequences. Uh, I, I did find uh, Mr Ruskell's comments very helpful, though, in explaining what his uh, intentions were around uh, uh, certain conditions applying, so that would be very helpful to understand better his intent. I, I would also note that the amendment would remo remove the degree of choice which were provided to local authorities in Part 3 uh, to reflect the extensive analysis and engagement that may be necessary to designate heat network zones, and the fact that many local authorities it will already have an understanding of the potential for heat networks in their area. I do appreciate that the approach currently provided for in the Bill uh, introduces the risk that opportunities could go unidentified, which is why Section 38 enables local authorities to request that the Scottish Ministers undertake this function on their behalf. And Section 44 of the Bill also provides a further safeguard. So Amendment 151 would certainly help to mitigate this risk of opportunities not being identified further. However, in light of um, the significant inconsistencies between, inconsistencies between Amendment 151 and the existing approach taken in Part 3, I would ask Mr Ruskell uh, not to press his amendment at this stage on the basis that my officials and I uh, will uh, work with Mr Ruskell in advance of Stage 3 uh, with a view to Mr Ruskell bringing forward a workable amendment then, uh, which the Scottish Government could lend its support to. Uh, so, Should it be pressed, I would urge members not to support Mr. Mr. Ruskell's Amendment 151 at this time, but I do just want to make the point we are keen to work with Mr. Ruskell uh, to ensure the, the intent that he, he has set out, well-intentioned uh, amendment, uh, is addressed by Stage 3. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, Mark Ruskell, do you wish to press or withdraw the Amendment 151? Um, thanks very much, convener. Um, I, I think on that basis and, and the, the comments about um, how it, this amendment would need to be reconciled more fully with part three, um, but you know, welcoming the fact that the minister you know, backs the intention behind this amendment, um, I would certainly be very keen to enter into further discussions ahead of stage three, and on that basis, um, I won't be moving the amendment this morning. Um, I think you need to perhaps withdraw it at this stage. I think you... Oh, sorry, I beg your yeah. Moved it or with the, with the permission of the committee, I'd like to withdraw Amendment 151. Does anyone object to Mr. Ruskell withdrawing the amendment? Um, I think Colin Beatty is uh, sorry, it's, it's um, no cancel that. I think uh, no member wishes to object, so uh, Amendment 151 is accordingly withdrawn. Thank you. The question now is that section 37 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're all agreed. Um, the question is that section 38 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're all agreed. And I now call amendment 64 in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment 2. Minister Form to move. Former move convener. Thank you. Uh, the question is that amendment 64 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're all agreed. Um, so I now move to the next grouping, which is Heat Network's Delivery Plan and Supply Target. And I call uh, Amendment 141 in the name of Mark Ruskell, grouped with Amendments 154, 142, 155, and 143. And I would ask Mark Ruskell to move Amendment 141 and speak to all amendments in the group. Yeah, thanks very much, convener. I'm happy to move uh, Amendment 141, and I, and I will speak to other uh, amendments in this grouping. Um, I think we've probably, as MSPs, all lost count of the number of bills in various sessions of Parliament that have considered targets uh, and action plans. And I think, you know, fundamentally, we all want to see direction and ambition on the face of bills in some shape or form. Um, I think there is a recognition that, that targets, at least in, in some areas of policy, certainly provide certainty, um, not least for investors. And I think in the area of energy, they've been shown to work with the renewable electricity target uh, being a clearly successful example of where a target has been applied. Um, I, I think um, in an ideal world, 
Uh, I'd like to see a terawatt hours target on the face of this bill proposed by Morris Golden's Amendment 155. But uh, I think in reality that a more accurate target could be developed once the work on heat network zones has been done on the ground and that there's a much more granular understanding of the actual heat resource that is out there waiting to be harnessed. And I think you know, that work may actually result in a more ambitious target uh, that sends an even stronger market signal to the sector. Um, so turning to, to 142 then, um, which is my sort of target amendment, I think it does put in place the right framework for setting a bottom-up target. Uh, and I would urge members to support it at stage two. Um, but I would be interested to hear from both the Minister and Mr Golden about uh, two issues. Firstly, the time scale for establishing targets in relation to this bill and also the need for parliamentary scrutiny. Uh, and I think finally, convener, in relation to Mr Golden's Amendment 154 on establishing a heat networks delivery plan, I mean, that from my perspective uh, appears to be very supportable. Um, it, it does deliver the kind of clarity that's needed and would fit quite nicely with the provision of a headline set of future targets under my Amendment 142. Thank you. Um, thank you. And I now call Morris Golden to speak to Amendment 154 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener, and I uh, thank Mark Rothskull for his uh, contribution and, and commitment to net zero. Um, in terms of Amendment 154, this amendment would require ministers to set out a delivery plan to put this bill into action, an obvious but fundamentally important part of ensuring the bill succeeds in its aims of developing low-carbon heaps in Scotland. The bill is an important step in driving forward renewable heat in Scotland, and I very much welcome it. However, this bill alone is not sufficient to see heatworks reach the needed scale in Scotland. For that, we will need to see many different actors come together – national governments, local authorities, private investment, local energy policies, and more. With so many moving pieces on the board, it is vital that we have a coordinated delivery plan to ensure each is where they need to be and that government policy is successfully coordinating and linking up all the various actions. A delivery plan would also provide the framework for practical concerns such as measuring outputs from heat networks, specifically specific policy choices to drive uptake and use, and how those policies and heat networks in general will fit into Scotland's overall climate goals. Importantly for all of this, ministers would keep the delivery plan under review to observe the evolution of low-carbon heat networks and how policy might have to adapt to changing circumstances. Finally, a delivery plan, much like the statement of intent over retrospective changes, would help provide investor certainty, knowing the ground rules, and that there is a solid foundation for low-carbon heat networks over the long term is crucial in order to attract the investment needed to see networks expand at pace. This amendment provides a straightforward means to provide that certainty. And moving on to Amendment 155, this amendment seeks to introduce clearly defined delivery targets in order to assess the of the bill in developing low-carbon heat networks in Scotland. And we know decarbonising heat will be a big step in reaching net zero in Scotland. And one of the stated aims of this bill is to develop low-carbon heat networks needed to do that. But without delivery targets, we have no way of assessing the pace or quality of development taking place. That is why targets cited in the amendment follow research from Scottish Renewables and are broadly in line with industry growth estimates. They represent a doubling of output from current levels by 2025 and then increasing to six terawatt hours by 2030. I appreciate some may have concerns about setting specific targets right now, even where they are following industry's lead. However, both this amendment and Amendment 142 from Mark Ruskell point to the same basic principle. Targets, whether specific numbers are set right now or not, are important for the aims of this bill to succeed. 
They will allow us to ensure we are on track and that heat is playing its part in reaching our 2045 net zero goal. But delivery targets are important in the here and now, too, because they sit alongside a delivery plan in providing the investor and operator certainty I mentioned previously. Our delivery plan sets the rules. Targets provide a clear space for operation with the knowledge that government is behind them in order to reach the goal. And that is not just for private investors. Setting local policy and planning objectives will be more assured if public bodies know the decisions they are taking are within a clearly defined policy goal. And again, all of this creates opportunities for a green recovery, especially in terms of job creation and transferable skills for those in declining industries. So setting sensible targets now will provide consistent rewards across the lifetime of this bill. Thank you, convener. Thank you. And Graham Simpson. Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, I'm just co comparing and contrasting the amendments 142 and 155 from Mark Ruskell and Maurice Golden. Um, they both deal with heat network supply targets. Um, however, Mr. Golden's is, is more specific than Mr. Ruskell's. Uh, it seems to me that you know, they both can't go through. Mr. Ruskell's allows uh, ministers to, to make the regulations. Mr. Golden is far more specific and you could argue far more, more ambitious, in fact. Um, you'd expect nothing less of Mr. Golden, would, would you not? Um, so, um, yes, you may well laugh, but uh, that's what I would expect from Mr. Golden. Um, so, I, th I think um, I, I would just I, I would quite like to hear, consider this an intervention on on both uh, members, um, what do they think of that? Because I don't think if Mr. Golden's uh, is to go through, then Mr. Ruskell's doesn't really work, and vice versa. So I'd, I'd really like to hear from both members. Uh, before I bring the minister in, then certainly I'm happy to come back to Mark Ruskell if he wants to respond to that first, and then to Morris Golden for response to that point. Um. I Thanks, Kavita. I, I could do. Um, however, I'd quite like to hear the minister's points as well, and then I think if I've got an opportunity to close this section, I can I can wrap it up. What I'll do, because I think Morris Golden is nodding his head in agreement with that approach. So what I'll do is I'll come to the minister now, and if either yourself or Morris Golden want to come back after the minister, then I'll bring you back in, then minister. Thank you, convener. Uh, and at, at, at the outset, just say in general terms. I would welcome the amendments that Mr. Ruskell and Mr. Golden have brought forward in this group, and, and indeed the, the ambition they have for the growth in heat networks is very welcome. In essence, they seek to make Scottish ministers more accountable for the delivery of the overall aim of this bill uh, through the greater deployment of heat networks in Scotland as well. And that's a, that's a laudable aim, and although I am one of the ministers that aspires to be held to that standard, I, I very much um, uh, welcome that scrutiny because what measures get gets done ultimately. The draft heat and building strategy, which we will publish shortly, includes a commitment to set a target for heat networks deployment in the final version of, of the document uh, following consultation on the draft. Uh, this is so that the national comprehensive assessment uh, on the potential for heat networks, which we are undertaking alongside the UK Government's Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, or BASE, uh, may be taken into account uh, in terms of giving us the evidence base uh, to establish the potential um, uh, demand for heat networks in Scotland and indeed uh, for the UK government across uh, England and Wales. We will also publish a heat network investment prospectus in the next financial year, which will include the first nationwide assessment in Scotland of the potential for heat networks. And this will be a first cut, if you like, and is intended to provide local authorities with evidence to build on as we move towards implementing Part Three of the bill. Um, but it will also be relevant to the setting of any target for heat networks. So. I am happy, however, to embrace the challenge that a, that a statutory target in relation to heat network deployment will bring. Mr. Ruskell's Amendment 142 and 143 uh, enable a target that was set by ministers and approved by the Parliament, uh, which gives the scrutiny I think that um, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Simpson uh, was looking for, which is well informed by the evidence I, I've just mentioned. 
as well as what may emerge when local authorities consider the potential for heat networks at a more local level, bringing in, for example, their understanding of local sentiment and issues at a local level. Uh, prior to today's meeting, Mr Ruskell and I have, have spoken about the need for well-evidenced target setting so that they are meaningful and helpfully, uh, helpfully stretch delivery ambitions. And I know this, is, um, uh, this objective is also supported by others, such as uh, the Liberal Democrats, who are not present in this discussion today. Amendments 142 and 143 enable this and provide for the full scrutiny uh, by Parliament in setting that target. And, convener, that is why I am happy to lend my support to those amendments. Um, it is only right that, uh, should targets be in place, then the contribution that new heat networks may make should be considered. Amendment 141 would enable that to happen when heat network zones are being identified by local authorities. And again, convener, I am happy to support this. Uh, turning to Mr. Golden's amendments, in light of what I said in regards to the need for an evidence-led target being set in this space, I, I cannot support Amendment 155, which sets very specific targets, which, while I am sure have come from a credible sources, uh, as a very credible source, as um, Mr. Golden has outlined, simply have not been verified by real or local knowledge and public engagement, with, uh, which Mr. Ruskell's amendments would allow for. So I am also concerned that this amendment does not provide any scope for the target to be amended, either up or down, as the evidence tells us may be appropriate in future. So I therefore urge Mr. Golden not to press Amendment 155. However, I am happy to support Mr. Golden's other amendment, 154, relating to preparation of a heat network's delivery plan by ministers. And it is very important that investors, supply, chain, uh, supply chains and consumers alike are informed of and confident in the plan. The government has, particularly when it comes to large and what will be costly infrastructure projects such as heat networks. Setting our targets will help us with this, uh, but Mr Goldman's, uh, Golden's uh, amendment would ensure that those groups are cited on exactly how the Scottish Government intends to ensure that our ambition and indeed seemingly that of the rest of the Parliament will be delivered. And it is also therefore I agree with him it would be self, uh, helpful in terms of supply chain development. The heat and building strategy, which I referenced earlier, will set some of this out, but in supporting Amendment 154, I am happy to commit to ensuring a fully comprehensive and dedicated heat networks delivery plan is published by April 2022. So, uh, convener, I urge members to support Mr Ruskell's amendments 141, 142 and 143, uh, support Mr Golden's amendment 154, uh, but uh, would urge Mr Golden not to press Amendment 155, and if it is pressed, I would urge members to resist Mr Golden's amendment uh, 155 for the reasons I've given. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Thank you. I don't know if Mr Ruskell, you possibly don't need to come back then in light of the minister's comments. Does Mr uh, unless you wish to, but does Mr Golden wish to come back? Uh, sorry. Just uh, say Mark. Thanks, Convener. Um yeah, I welcome the, the, the Minister's uh, comments, and uh, I, I do agree that um, in terms of, of 154, uh, I welcome his support. And for Amendment 155, if it were to be passed uh, today, then I would seek to work with the Scottish Government and the Minister on uh, ensuring that we have better evidence-based targets. The, this is the, the targets which I have outlined in the amendment are uh, from in industry and are from uh, an evidence base, and also uh, could help to provide the signal and indeed the ambition um, that many of our other net zero uh, targets uh, rely on. And it's in uh, that uh, rash thinking that I have proposed uh, Amendment 155. All right. At this stage, um, I come back to Mr. Ruskell in any event to ask him to wind up and to press or withdraw his Amendment 141. So you may make whatever yeah. comments you want. Once the minister. Okay. Thanks very much, um, convener. And, and yes, I can confirm this morning that on this issue there is little difference in ambition between myself and, and Mr. Golden. I think we both want to get to the same place here. It's just the, the process by which we want to get there. Um, Firstly, can I say it's good that there's a consensus around the need for a strong plan, um, as incorporated into the Amendment 154. I think, in particular, the Minister's commitment to deliver that plan by April 22 
is is critical at, at, at sending a strong signal um, to industry. And in terms of the, the nature of, a, of an individual target, should it be on the face of the bill um, or not? I mean, I, I note Mr. Golden's comments that the, the figures that he's got in this current amendment are broadly in line with the growth estimates that are established by industry. I think that what, I, what convinces me is the comments that the minister made about the detailed work that's happening at the moment, like actually at the moment, about the um, the potential um, for heat building networks, the detail work that's going on on, on the ground, um, the evidence base that's building up. And I, what I would hope is that actually, as I said in my initial comments, that we could get a more ambitious target and a target that much is much more focused on the reality of the assets and the potential that is there on the ground. Um, I suppose the only, the only point I would make at, uh, at this stage would be, you know, whether there may be scope for further discussion uh, ahead of stage three, um, particularly in relation to a, a starting date um, for any target that could then align with um, the development of that plan and its launch by April 2022. So if the Minister and Mr Golden wanted to have further discussions ahead of stage three, I'd be, I'd be more than happy um, to be part of that, but in the meantime, I would I would urge uh, Mr. Golden to not move 155, and uh, that I will be moving uh, 141 in my name. Thank you. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 141 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. And at this stage, I call Amendment 15. Two in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 149. Uh, Alex Rowley, to move or not to move? Not moved. Thank you. Um, and then the question is that Section 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're all agreed. question is that Section 40 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And I come to the next uh, grouping, which is Amendment 153 in a group on its own in the name of Mark Ruskell. Mark Ruskell to move and speak to Amendment uh, 153. Um, okay, thanks very much, um, Pinvina. Um, I, I recognise that um, you know this amendment is is potentially quite quite controversial given you know where the bill has arrived at in terms of trying to navigate the devolved and the reserved uh, competencies particularly around consumer protection um, but but i do want to raise the issue again uh, that you took evidence on at stage one of, of demand risk um, the risk that owners of large anchor buildings with vast heat loads uh, may be quite happy to continue to, you know, heat the sky without there ever being an obligation uh, to harness the benefits of that waste heat for communities. Uh, and, and I have to say, like in the past, um, I have shared some frustrations within my own community uh, where we were trying to encourage a distillery uh, to consider uh, options for heat network, which really led to, to nothing happening at all. Uh, and, and I think, you know, where we are right now is time is against us with a climate emergency, and we we really need fast here. Um, so, you know, I admit this is quite a stark amendment. I mean, it says that councils would make the decision about what buildings would be suitable for connection, and they would have the power uh, to make this happen. Uh, I should point out the intention here is not to include individual domestic buildings, and if there is a concern uh, in relation to that, then this amendment could be refined further um, to make that more explicit. Um, however, um, we cannot see large public and private sector buildings continue to be wasting heat uh, in the middle of a, of a climate emergency, and, and particularly when we face unacceptable levels of fuel poverty and the need to build in energy security for the future as well. Uh, and I do think that whilst this bill sets the right framework for things to happen where organisations want to do them anyway and have financial backing, it, it doesn't demand progress. Um, so the Section 58 powers on Whaley's, for example, you know, they help, help to push a network further where there already is one uh, being developed. But it won't shift a major anchor building owner to become the foundation stone 
of a brand new heat network. Um, so, without sort of preempting what the minister might say here, if the solution to this is not this amendment, then I would ask the minister to identify what what is the solution. Is it about ensuring that priority types of buildings for public procurement, in the case of um, you know Liam MacArthur's later amendment? Um, will the answer to this be in the heat and building strategy? Uh, and, and I very much welcome the Minister's thoughts on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Graham Simpson. Thanks very much, uh, convener. Um, yeah, yeah I, I mean, I hear where Mark Ruskell's coming from here, but he's accepted that this uh, amendment is controversial. Um, and when we're dealing with uh, legislation, you know this yourself, convener, as a as a, as a lawyer, um, words matter. So it, it's how how this amendment is worded. A local authority may require any suitable building within its area to connect to a heat network. Um, and despite what Mark Ruskell says, that, that that could include domestic properties because of the way this amendment is worded. And even if it wasn't just domestic properties, we have the issue of, you know, a, a council effectively forcing any building owner to connect to a heat network, whether or not they want to. Uh, and that could that could be a, a, at some cost to them. So I think I think Mark Ruskell accepts this is uh, perhaps not not the best way to achieve what he wants uh, and i would simply invite him on that basis not to move this amendment uh minister thank you convener um I have a great deal of sympathy with uh, for, for mr ruskell's amendment uh, obviously on the basis that the more we can do to create demand for heat networks within reason, the more likely we are to secure the growth that we are all seeking in this discussion this morning. I cannot, however, uh, suggest to committee members that this amendment is supported. Uh, there are two major reasons for this, which uh, have, have been broadly touched on, but I will go into uh, to briefly cover myself. Firstly, Amendment 153 is extraordinarily wide-ranging, uh, so much so that it is highly likely to be out with uh, legislative competence, while paragraphs A and B of subsection 1 would act to provide some limited constraints on the power which would be uh, given by the amendment to require a building to connect to a heat network. It remains a very wide power, and there are several questions that remain un unaddressed. The fundamental question is, what would mandatory connection entail in practice? Would it require only changes to the fabric of the building, or is it envisaged that the owner of the building must also use the system? If the latter, on what terms and how are the terms of supply to be entered into? Uh, and regulated, and when should the mandatory connection itself take place? What rights might there be to alter or terminate the supply? And, and if it is intended to be just a duty to install the physical apparatus and infrastructure necessary for the building to be linked to a heat network, then who is to carry out such works and to pay for them, and what timescales are envisaged? So, If the intention is that connection to heat network would also require the building use heat from the heat network, what can the local authority do in order to require this? Um, is this a requirement to enter into supply contracts with a heat network operator? And does power extend to requiring heat network operators to supply heat to the building? And if so, in what terms and conditions? There is also no indication of what might make a building suitable, uh, as, as defined in the, the amendment, or how this might be uh, ascertained. So the power would apply uh, to all buildings as, as drafted, including domestic properties, as uh, Mr. Simpson just outlined, in a heat network zone if they are considered to be suitable buildings. However, suitability uh, does not itself does not uh, depend upon there being a building assessment report for the building, and so it is not clear how a building's suitability is to be determined. That may not have been the intention, given uh, references to building assessment reports at subsection 2, but the powers set out in the amendment would apply to the domestic sector and to any other buildings that do not have a building's assessment report. So I would have concerns about that, not only due to the current lack of consumer protection, which we're unable to, ourselves to provide for uh, in this place, but also because the heat network sector itself has often told us they do not want such powers to exist over residential buildings, as not only would the connection of homes have marginal effect on the business case for a new network heat network, they do not believe it's conducive to a positive relationship with potential future customers. 
The amendment makes uh, no provisions for building owners to make representations to inform or to challenge the decision of a local authority. It would seem reasonable to me that building owners and businesses should be allowed to put forward their views on how their own building might be heated. For example, this might be to highlight that there is already a functional heating system in the building, uh, could be a renewable one, or that the building itself already uses renewable heating, as I say, as around 50 per cent of the non-domestic sector does, if we include the use of electric heating in that, uh, in that uh, uh, category. It is not clear from the amendment what is meant by competitive cost, and nor does it indicate how our local authority might ascertain what is a competitive cost for a building. What is considered a competitive cost is subjective as well. It is likely that there will be disagreement between the owner of the building required to connect and the heat network operator as to what is a competitive cost, and the local authority may also have a different view. It is also uh, not clear if the power to require connection imposes duties on heat network operators to extend their heat networks uh, to suitable buildings, and whether it requires heat network operators to supply heat at a competitive cost. Notwithstanding the challenges I've set out, the, the Scottish Government is committed, because uh, I, I know Mr Russell is looking for guidance as, as to what we will do to tackle this, as set out in our Climate Change Plan update, to consult this year on the use of existing powers to strongly encourage uh, what are termed as anchor buildings uh, owners uh, within heat network zones to connect to and use local schemes. This includes, for example, the potential use of Section 15 of the Non-Domestic Rates Scotland Act 2020 to create reliefs for those buildings which do connect. Uh, or supplements for those which do not. Uh, the latter may be similar to the non-connection charge, which the committee will be aware has operated in Denmark. I appreciate that the commitment to consult later this year sits out with the timescale for this bill and comes after the Scottish Parliament elections in 2021, uh, but I am sure that members will agree that the introduction of changes like the potential ones I have suggested warrant extensive consultation with building owners before such provisions would be introduced. Finally, I would also like to note that the bill already re reduces investment risk and reduces overall costs by creating heat network zone permits, which will provide a chance to compete, develop and operate a system in a prime area with information and confidence about the customer base within it, as well as enabling the pipe work costs to be repaid in line with their long-lived use, and providing uh, new rights to license holders under Part 6, which will quicken the construction of networks and reduce the significant civil engineering costs that are faced. So it is important that we strike the right balance between supporting and enabling heat network development and consumer protection. I regret I am not sure Mr Ruskell's amendment, though I appreciate its well intention, strikes that balance at this time. So, convener, while I am sympathetic towards the intention of Mr Ruskell's amendment, I do not believe it offers a workable or legally robust solution to the issue of demand risk. In a sense, potentially, it is at risk of putting the perfection in, in the way of, of, of achieving a good outcome here. And putting that at jeopardy, so I would strongly urge members not to support Mr. Ruskell's well-intentioned amendment 153 in the interests of the passage of the bill as a whole. Thank you very much, Convener. Thank you, um, Mark Ruskell, to wind up and to press or withdraw amendment 153. Okay, thanks very much, um, Convener. I mean, you know, this is a, a classic probing amendment, and I think. You know, I think some of the contributions there are, are, are very welcome. I mean, there is a debate about, you know, what is a suitable building, and I think it's quite clear that there will be anchor buildings and owners of anchor buildings uh, which are suitable, uh, which are wasting heat, which do need to be connected to the to the heat network going forward. And I think, you know, how we address that, how we encourage, uh, and, and in in some cases, you know, strongly encourage. These building owners to connect in, I think, is is critical. And you know, there are clearly different ways to do that. I mean, I think you know the minister just reiterated um, the, the the provision there under rates relief as being you know one driver that can you know nudge building operators towards um, you know uh, playing ball and effectively you know um, connecting in with a heat network or you know, driver to consider that at least. Um, I, I do think there needs. Be consideration of what the industry requires here to de-risk investment, and I think if there are if there are long-term concerns about whether anchor buildings are actually going to you know play ball and actually be part of the consideration of heat network zones, then that does create um, uncertainty going forward, and that could in, impact on on you know financial bankability of, of, of projects with investors. So um, you know with that in mind, I'm sure there'll be more to come out um, from the Scottish government. And this could be an issue that could be considered 
um, in the heat action plan as well going forward. So on that basis, I won't be moving this amendment. Um, I think, uh, again, I think it, you, you have to actually indicate if you're withdrawing at this stage. Uh, okay. Um, yes, I'll be uh, withdrawing uh, um, the does amendment. Does anyone the Ruskell withdrawing that amendment at this stage. No member objects. So the question now is that sections 41, 42, 43 and 44 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. So I now call amendment 65 in the name of the minister already debated with amendment two minister to move formally. Formally move convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 65 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call Amendment 66 in the name of the Minister already debated. Minister to move formally. Uh, formally moved, Convener. The question is that Amendment 66 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The question now is that Section 45 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed, and the question is that sections 46, 47, 48, and 49 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I turn to the next grouping, uh, which is to deal with revocation of heat network and, uh, sorry, to deal with revocation of heat network zone permits, process, and appeals. And I call Amendment 67 in the name of the Minister grouped with amendments 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, and 127. So, Minister. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, convener, the amendments which I have brought forward in this group are similar to those which are lodged in groups 4 and 6 in relation to appeals against the revocation of Heat Network's licences and Heat Network's consents, respectively. Members will recall that those amendments sought to address the Committee's recommendation to introduce the opportunity for licence holders to appeal in the event that the licence was revoked by the licensing authority. The committee's recommendations did not extend to the revocation of heat network zone permits. Section 46 enables a person other than Scottish ministers to be designated as the permit authority. And in light of this and for consistency throughout the Bill, uh, I believe that it would be right to amend the Bill to enable regulations to be made to allow for appeals to be made in the event that the permitting authority revokes a zone permit. Now, the primary amendment which would achieve this is Amendment 71. This amendment would create a new power for the Scottish Ministers to create an appeals process against the revocation of heat network zone permits. This is a broad power, uh, but subsection 2 clarifies a number of matters that such regulations and therefore such an appeals process would feature. These include who may appeal, why an appeal may be brought, how appeals are to be lodged, and the information that may be required, as well as how decisions are to be determined. These regulations would also be able to specify who would hear appeals. Uh, convener Section 46 um, makes clear that Scottish ministers would act as the permitting authority for the purposes of Part 4, unless they were to designate another person to take on, on this function by regulations. We have not yet formed a view on whether another body should take on this role, and we plan to consult on this as part of our consultation on the secondary legislation later this year, subject to the passage of the Bill. Uh, but given that the possibility exists that the Scottish ministers would not or would not always take on this function, then as with heat networks licences, it seems appropriate that powers exist so that an appeals process against revocations may be heard by the Scottish ministers. In light of the committee's views on the deficit for appeals in relation to heat network licences, I trust that members will, will welcome this. Amendment 72 would enable regulations to be made in respect of compensation in consequence of revocation of a heat network zone permit in certain circumstances. Subsection 2 specifies a range of matters that these regulations may include, such as the circumstances in which compensation is payable, the calculation of compensation, the procedure for claiming compensation, and the review and appeal of decisions made under the regulations. This amendment would not only introduce the opportunity for compensation to be made to those who have had their zone permit removed and, in turn, the right to operate a heat network in the relevant zone, it would also ensure consistency with Section 25, which enables compensation to be made to those heat network operators or developers who have had a heat network consent revoked. Amendment 127 would amend Section 81 of the Bill so that regulations may be made about compensation 
for the revocation of heat network zone permit uh, is added to the list of delegated powers under the bill which are subject to the affirmative procedure. This is in keeping with the procedure that is to be used for other regulation making powers in, in relation to compensation within the bill as sections 25, 63, 67 and 75. Section 50 currently provides that a heat network zone permit may be revoked in the event of a heat network's licence or heat network consent being revoked. Amendment 69 would enable the circumstances in which a zone permit may be revoked to be extended by regulations. This is felt necessary as a precaution to cover situations, for example, where the basis on which uh, an application for a permit was granted later turns out to be inaccurately represented. Section 50 also ensures that there is a rigorous process in place before a zone permit may be revoked. This ensures that the permitting authority must notify the permit holder of its intention to revoke and that permit holders have the chance to make representations against revocation before a final decision is made. Convener Amendments 67 and 68 would make minor drafting changes in consequence of Amendment 69. And finally, Amendment 70 would allow the Scottish Minister to, Ministers to expand the regulations on the procedure to be followed in connection with the revocation of a zone permit. It may, for example, uh, be that other persons should be informed of the permitting authority's intention to revoke a zone permit, or that there should be a process set out for how representations are to be considered. In any event, the powers are there to ensure that any further procedural protections which are considered appropriate can be set out in legislation rather than simply uh, being administrative arrangements. So I ask members to support each of the amendments in the group, and I move Amendment 67 in my name. Thank you, Minister. Graham Simpson. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, I, I support these amendments, but I just have a question for the Minister, who has to sum up anyway, so he can answer it then. Um, the Minister says that uh, those hearing the appeals may not be Scottish Ministers, it could be somebody else. Now, I'm guessing that he's not suggesting that a, a new body is set up to hear these appeals. I don't think um, we'll be uh, inundated with, with uh, appeals of this nature. It's not like uh, the planning system where there's a steady stream of appeals. I, don't, I think I, I would imagine there'll be a handful uh, in a year. So I'd, I wouldn't think we're talking about setting up a new body. So I just wonder if the minister could clarify um, what it is he's thinking of. Um, would it be an existing body if it's not to be ministers? Um, minister, to wind up and perhaps respond to that point. Yeah, just I think um, just to, to say that Mr. Simpson's understanding of the situation is correct. Um, that we're not uh, at this point planning to establish another another body. It's uh, merely this is giving us a space to consider what proper arrangements. Uh, should be put in place for that. And I hope that's uh, some reassurance to Mr. Simpson. Uh, but happy to uh, discuss that matter with them between uh, stage two and stage three if, if he has any further concerns. Um, thank you. In that case, the question is that Amendment 67 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're all agreed. I call Amendments 68, 69 and 70, all in the name of the Minister and previously debated. I invite the Minister to move Amendments 68 to 70 en bloc. Uh, moved en bloc, Convener. Thank you. Does any member object to these being put on a single question? No. In that event, the question is that Amendments 68 to 70 are agreed. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. And the question is that section 50 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're all agreed. And I call amendment 71 in the name of the minister already debated with amendment 67. Uh, minister to move formally. On the move, convener. Uh, the question is that amendment 71 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call amendment 72 in the name of the minister already debated. Minister to move formally. Uh, I think the Minister has moved that formally. question is that Amendment 72 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The question is that Section 51 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And we now come to the next uh, section of amendments. And this grouping 
uh, is supply of thermal energy by means of a heat network to state-funded educational buildings. So I call Amendment 158 in the name of Liam MacArthur, grouped with Amendment 159. Liam MacArthur to move Amendment 158 and speak to both amendments in the group. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Amendments 158 and 159 are arguably alternate uh, amendments. Their purpose is to add emphasis and focus to the job of decarbonising Scotland's learning estate. They do this by making clear new duties to consider how to connect schools to green heat networks as part of a bid to drive the decarbonisation of the school estate. The emboldened parts of the bill that are already exist. And these proposals have been championed by Teach the Future, a group campaigning to put the climate emergency at the centre of education in Scotland and to arm the next generation with the facts and tools they need to combat the climate crisis. As part of this campaign, students say that all new state-funded Scottish educational buildings should be net zero from 2022, and all existing state-funded Scottish educational buildings should be retrofitted to net zero by 2030. The group say, and I quote, if our education system is to teach students about sustainability, the buildings they learn within must be sustainable. Indeed, many school buildings are ideally situated to work with the heat network technology. This approach here is one that this parliament and the Scottish Liberal Democrats have taken before, recognising the public sector's duty and responsibility to promote and show confidence in green technologies. In the recent Climate Change Act, I made this argument successfully in terms of public procurement of electric vehicles. Amendments 158 and 159 apply a similar logic. The public sector has significant influence over green technology uptake. Not only does it hold the key to choosing environmentally friendly options for its infrastructure, but showing confidence in those options helps normalise such ideas. In terms of the specific amendments, uh, Amendment 158 goes further than 159 in that it uh, directly imports the targets from the Teach the Future campaign. 2022 is the date settled on by the campaign based on their own reflections and research. 2030 reflects the interim target set by the most recent Climate Change Act and is the date by which uh, much of this work will need to have been done uh, if Scotland has any hope of meeting its commitment to net zero by 2045. Amendment 159 simply makes clear that the obligations contained in Part 5 of the Bill have particular relevance to the learning estate. With very little additional burden, it strengthens existing ambitions. Beyond the obvious support from Teach the Future, WWF and the National Union of Students have also welcomed these proposed changes. As I said at Stage 1, I acknowledge and welcome the collaborative and consultative approach taken by the Minister in relation to this Bill to date. I know he has reservations about um, these proposals, but I remain happy to work with him and indeed uh, colleagues uh, on the committee to adjust and refine uh, where necessary. In the meantime, I look forward to hearing um, the comments of you and your colleagues and move Amendment 158 in my name. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Graham Simpson. Uh, um, thanks very much. And can I thank Liam McCall for, for bringing these amendments forward. I, th I, th I think they're important um, for the reason that they send out a signal um, that we are ambitious to deliver a low carbon economy. And one of the ways we can do that is by getting our um, state buildings connected to heat networks, in this case, schools. Now, Liam MacArthur's right that his two amendments are slightly at odds with each other. 158 goes much further than 159. So it would be useful when he's summing up if he if he could indicate which approach he prefers. So if we look if we look at 158, which says that all new state funded educational buildings from next year should be connected to a heat network. And that by April 2030, that's not that far away really, all existing state funded educational buildings should be connected to a heat network. Now on point on on, on that first point, I, I would have thought that is in that is possible to achieve. I mean I've seen uh, in the area that I represent that many new 
schools um, are, are, have their own um, renewable energy sources or, or are connected to a heat network. I don't, I don't think that's unachievable. The second point, if we think about it, um, was saying that all existing buildings should be connected. Well, have a think about um, you know some of the some schools, colleges uh, sit. Uh, they're, 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 they're quite. They could be quite old. They could be in uh, city centres. Uh, I mean, I can think of there's a school just up the road from where you're sitting now, convener, uh, in Parliament, um, with, which. Um, you know, I, I would imagine it's quite difficult to connect some existing buildings to a heat network. I think the, pre, the, the practicalities of that present some problems. So uh, I would really like to hear, uh, I like, want to hear from the Minister and then from Mr MacArthur, because uh, I, I can see issues with 158, but certainly not 159. Thank you. All right, Minister. Thank you, convener, and uh, I appreciate the, the, the comments that have been made by, by colleagues. And I should say, I, I understand uh, from what Mr. MacArthur has said, indeed, Mr. Simpson's uh, sympathies with this. That I understand the rationale uh, for, for for bringing this um, these these amendments forward, which has certainly stimulated a, a debate at this point. But in many, many respects, my view on the amendments in Mr. MacArthur's laws are similar to those I raised when we debated Mr. Ruskell's amendment, Group 13, and I appreciate that. Um, Mr. Mr. MacArthur may not have heard that debate because he was uh, appearing at Justice Committee before coming on to this this discussion. Um, but just to set out for him that we uh, made, made the point that we will uh, look through the uh, work that we have committed to do as set out in our climate change plan update to consult this year on the use of existing powers to strongly encourage anchor building orders, which might include educational buildings and in, uh, in some local communities within heat network zones to connect to and use. Local schemes, and there were a number of provisions I set out around how we might incentivise um, the, uh, the the potential connection for uh, non non public buildings as well. Uh, but I won't rehearse the concerns that I set out around uh, Group 13. Though I will briefly note that Subsection 1 of Amendment 158 again raises concerns about what the Scottish ministers are to require of these buildings and how uh, they can make it happen. So uh, I posed some questions. I suppose it be useful if Mr. MacArthur can maybe feedback on them, but Simply to be, would it be simply to have the necessary equipment, apparatus, etc., installed within the building, or would it require actual use of the system? If it were the former, there is the risk that significant sums may be spent on the installation of kit which goes unused, and that would obviously potentially be unhelpful to the local education authority. Uh, the local authority. If it were the latter, I must again raise the question as to how the relationship between the building owner and the heat network operator are to be regulated. Uh, in the interest of moving the debate forward, though, convener, I will not linger on these issues. Rather, I would raise some very practical concerns with Amendment 158. It places, uh, as drafted, a duty on the Scottish ministers to ensure that educational buildings connect to their heat networks. It's, uh, however, it is unclear how this is to be achieved and whether this is required if there is no local heat network available to connect to or if the cost of creating a new network for the sole purposes of serving an educational building were to be obstructively high. I also question why the Scottish ministers would be responsible for ensuring that all education bu educational buildings are connected to heat networks, given that it is primarily local authorities and others within the public sector who are responsible for educational buildings. There are also technical issues I would highlight in these amendments. Uh, there is, uh, I just point out, no definition of what is a state-funded educational building, meaning this amendment could have unintended consequences going beyond schools, colleges and universities. There are questions as to whether the requirements of section, uh, subsection 1 apply to, for example, community centres where adult evening classes take place or other facilities where state-funded or partially state-funded education takes place. Would grant-aided schools be captured, for example? Turning to Amendment uh, 159, on the face of it, this is less concerning given that the general effect of it is to make further provision about building assessment reports conducted in respect of uh, state-funded educational buildings. However, my, my overriding concern um, with the amendments in this group is that while the public sector should certainly lead by example in decarbonising its building stock, and as I've outlined at the beginning, we're keen to take some of that work forward through the climate change plan update, uh, which would extend obviously not just to public buildings but uh, potentially other anchor buildings. The Scottish Government's estate is obviously included in the scope of uh, decarbonising uh, the public public sector building stock. We cannot see a, a compelling reason for treating the learning estate as a subsector 
and somehow different to other public sector buildings. I do take on board Mr McArthur's well intentioned comments around uh, the, the kind of educational aspects of this, but there is no convincing reason to create a subset of requirements for educational buildings. I do accept the points, as I say, that schools could make good anchor loads for heat networks, particularly if they have a swimming pool attached, for example, uh, which may happen in some places. And therefore, um, you know, I, I do I do accept that's well intentioned. But the same could be said of hospitals, leisure centres, prisons, other government buildings, local authority headquarters, and so on. So, for that reason, and my previous concerns in regards to, to Group 13, which I appreciate Mr. McArthur may not have been able to hear in, hear in full, I would ask Mr. McArthur not to press his amendments 158 and 159. And if pressed, I would ask members not to support either amendment. If there is a means of finding a way through this, I would be keen to work with Mr. McArthur. Uh, between now and stage three, uh, but at this point, I do not have a, a defined view as to how we can achieve the outcome he seeks, other than to reiterate the point that we, we will be taking forward significant work through the uh, consultation following the Climate Change Plan update, and hope that we would pick up this important issue that he and Mr Simpson have raised in the context of that work. So, thank you, Convener. Thank you, Minister. Liam MacArthur to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 158. Hey. Thank you very much, Convener. Can I start by thanking uh, Graham Simpson and the, the Minister for uh, their constructive comments? I think uh, Graham Simpson referred to uh, the importance of uh, signalling our ambition, uh, and the Minister, I think, rightly acknowledged uh, the need for the public sector to, to lead by example. I, I, uh, I, uh, I hear and understand the, the concerns um, that have been expressed in relation uh, particularly to, to, to 158, which I accept is, is a more challenging amendment. Uh, but also with 159 as well. I, uh, apologies to you and committee colleagues that, as a result, as the minister said, of my commitments um, to uh, voting on the defamation bill in the Justice Committee, um, I was not able to um, listen in to the exchanges in relation to Group 13 uh, and the uh, amendments that uh, Mark Ruskell uh, moved. I, I think in that context, I would be very happy to involve, be involved in those discussions between the Minister Mark Ruskell and any other colleagues, Graham Simpson possibly, and other colleagues, um, about how we move this forward. I, I recognise that there is a case for, uh, for the public sector as a whole um, taking a lead here. I think, though, that there is an expectation uh, amongst um, the younger generation that we kick-start our ambitions in terms of heat networks. Uh, and no better place uh, could that be exemplified, I think, than within uh, the learning estate. Um, but that is not to hold back uh, progress in other areas as well. But for the time being, convener, um, I am happy not to move either 158 uh, and 159 and take part in those discussions as previously referred to. Um, so, are you withdrawing Amendment 158 at this stage? I withdraw 158 at this stage, yeah. Thank you. Uh, does any member object to Mr. MacArthur withdrawing uh, that amendment? No member does. Um, and we then move on to the question that Section 52 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. And the question is that Sections 53 to 57 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Um, we now move on to the grouping on network. Way leave rights, and I call Amendment 73 in the name of the Minister grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Minister to move Amendment 73 and speak to all amendments in the group. Minister. Thank you, Convener. And uh, such as the length of this section, I've been caught out trying to find my speaking note, but I have now found it. So thank you. Um, the subject of network way leave rights was discussed at length at stage one, following the evidence provided by. Professor uh, Roderick Paisley, Solicitor and Chair of Scots Law at University of Aberdeen, and Mr Scott Workley, uh, Solicitor and Lecturer in Commercial Law at the University of Edinburgh. As discussed during my appearance in front of the committee at Stage 1 and during the Stage 1 debate, we have reflected on the critique made on these provisions, and the amendments in this grouping seek to deal with many of the issues raised. Amendment 81 uh, would provide um, a, a network way leave right constitutes a real right. Amendment 99 removes provision in the Bill uh, about persons bound by network way leave rights, which are no longer necessary as a result. Amendments 73, 74 and 76 make some refinements to the description of the right being conferred. Amendment 73 uh, provides that the primary right is a right for a licence holder to convey steam or liquids in land for a purpose connected with the supply of thermal energy 
by means of a heat network uh, by the license holder. Amendment 74 provides that the rights currently listed in paragraphs A and B of section 58.1, uh, subsection 1, become rights ancillary to the primary right. And Amendment 76 inserts a new paragraph to avoid having a closed list of ancillary rights, which would allow the license holder to carry out any necessary or incidental works. We have also reflected on evidence given about possible ways in which network uh, wayleave rights can be created. Amendment 77 would provide that, in addition to a network wayleave right being created by agreement between the owner of the land and the license holder, it can also be created by universe, a unilateral grant of the owner. Amendments 86, 90, 92, 93, 94, 97, 98, and 100, and 122 are consequential to changes made by Amendment 77 to reflect that a network wayleave right could also be conferred on a license uh, unilaterally. Amendment 86 also includes a definition of owner, with consequential Amendment 122 adjusting the interpretation provisions in the Bill as a result. Um, amendment 78 refers to the possibility of a network wayleave right being created by positive prescription. This is a, a result of Amendment 80, which applies Section 3, Subsection 2 of the Prescription and Limitations Scotland Act 1973 with the necessary modifications. This follows recommendations from Professor Paisley in his written evidence to the committee. Convener, the next couple of amendments, 78 and 88, are introduced to enable development conditions to be imposed as part of the creation of a network wayleave right. Amendment 79 ensures this applies to voluntary network wayleave rights created by a wayleave document. Amendment 88 provides a necessary wayleave may also include such a condition. Uh, a development condition is a condition which would restrict or regulate the development of use of the land as may be required to prevent interference with the exercise of the network wayleave right, particularly to prevent damage to apparatus or disruption to service. Amendment 82 provides that the installation of apparatus over property does not confer ownership of the heat network apparatus on the owner of the land. This avoids the possibility of a license holder uh, losing ownership of apparatus as a result of placing it in or on the land. Greener now, I would like to uh, turn to the subject of notices associated with necessary wayleaves. Before applying to Scottish ministers for a necessary wayleave, the license holder is first to seek a network wayleave right from the owner. The normal position is that the license holder is required to give notice to the owner of the land, settling out the license holder's request to acquire a network wayleave right. However, there may be cases where the license holder cannot ascertain the name or address of the owner of the land after reasonable inquiry. Amendment 91 provides that in such cases, the license holder is to give notice in such form and manner as may be specified by the Scottish Ministers by regulations. And amendment 89 is a technical drafting change to accommodate Amendment 91. Amendment 95 makes a consequential change needed as a result of Amendments 77 and 91. Amendment 96 is also a consequential change needed as a result of Amendment 91. Davina, the registration of wayleave rights was one of the key issues discussed during the committee evidence sessions. Professor Paisley, in his evidence, recommended that wayleaves should be registered in the land register, make them real, principally for the purposes of transparency. However, Mr. Wortley highlighted that not registering in the land register would be consistent with the general approach to wayleaves in other contexts. I noted that requiring network wayleave rights to be registered may raise some issues, for instance, in relation to who would be required to bear the costs of registration. I considered this matter in the context of the aim of this bill which is looking to help stimulate deployment of heat networks across Scotland to assist with meeting our ambitious emission reduction and fuel poverty targets. Amendment 104 would provide the Scottish Ministers with the power to make provision by regulations about the registration of network wayleave rights. The regulations could in particular make provision about how a network wayleave right is to be registered, who is required to establish and maintain the register, and for any fees payable in connection with the registration. This provides, we believe, the flexibility and allows time to consult about the best solution with the industry. And I trust this approach will be satisfactory and offer the best way forward to meet both the aims of this bill, but also comments raised at stage one, and notably by Professor Paisley and uh, Mr. Wortley. Turning now to Amendment 101, this amendment makes provision for the variation of network wayleave rights, provides that a network wayleave right may only be varied by agreement between the parties 
or by the Scottish ministers following an application by the license holder or the owner of the land. The variation of a network may leave right and may ha might have consequence uh, for an owner or occupier of the land. Therefore, Amendment 102 or 102 inserts a new section to provide that the compensation may be recovered from the license holder in respect of the variation. This would occur where the Scottish ministers grant a variation of a network way leave right following an application by a license holder so as to place or increase the burden on the owner or occupier. Amendment 103 provides that a network way leave right may only be discharged by the license holder entitled to the exercise of a network way leave right, either by agreement with the owner of the land or unilaterally. It also provides that a license holder must discharge a network way leave right if it relates to apparatus that has ceased to be used for the purposes of a heat network. Amendment 105 relates to the requirement to remove apparatus when notified. It would require a person who has a right to remove all or part of any heat network apparatus to give notice to the license holder if they wish to enforce the removal. This is most likely to occur because there is no valid network way leave right in respect of the installation of the apparatus. And removal of apparatus, which is still in operation, clearly has the potential to disrupt or interrupt supply of thermal energy by the heat network. The existing provisions uh, of section 62, subsection 6 to 8 are unaffected, which would enable the license holder to apply for the grant of a necessary way leave or submit a compulsory purchase order to establish a right to retain the apparatus in place. Before I finish with this particular grouping, there are a number of technical amendments that I lodged that are largely consequential to the changes I have just outlined. Uh, amendments 75, 87, 110 and 111 are technical drafting changes to clarify what is meant by references in the Bill to the placement of apparatus in land. Amendments 83 and 84 adjust the definition of heat network apparatus to make it clear that it includes any structure for housing or for providing access to such apparatus. Lastly, uh, convener, amendments 106, 107, 108, 109, 112, 113, 114, 115, 116, 117, 118, 119, 120, and 123 remove unnecessary references to persons acting on behalf of license holders and make necessary consequential amendments. I, I ask members to support each of the amendments in the group, and I move Amendment 73 in my name. Thank you, Minister. There's uh, no questions from other members, but I have just one question, and that is, is the Minister um, convinced or is the purpose of the amendments that he's just gone through to simplify and clarify the particular aspect of way leaves in this bill? And I'm sure the Minister will be able to respond to that without having to repeat everything he's just said. So I'll hand it back to the Minister to, to perhaps respond to that and to wind up. Uh, we believe, please, so convener that that we have um, provided suitable clarity there. But uh, e equally, I welcome any engagement with members after stage two if there are matters they believe uh, require further clarity. Thank you, Minister. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 73 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call Amendments 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83 and 84, all in the name of the Minister as previously debated, and I invite the Minister to move those Amendments 74 to 84 en bloc. Moved en bloc, Convener. Thank you. Does any member object to the a single question being put on those amendments, 74 to 84? No objection. Therefore, the question is that amendments 74 to 84 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I then call amendment 85 in the name of the minister, which is grouped with amendment 121, and this is the grouping on roadworks powers of certain holders of heat network licenses. And I'll call on the minister, therefore, to move amendment 85 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. And um, uh, the amendments I've lodged in this grouping relate to additional rights that certain license holders will be granted to, to carry out roadworks, as you say. I, I committed to bringing forward this amendment at introduction of the bill to the Scottish Parliament, as it serves an important purpose to place certain license holders on the same level of uh, footing as other statutory undertakers by granting them roadwork rights. A set out in our policy memorandum, researched by the Energy Technologies Institute, found that civil engineering, that is the digging of 
trenches and the laying of pipes accounts for roughly 40% of a network's capital costs. These costs can be reduced through granting greater utility rights to heat network developers, which in turn can reduce costs for consumers and facilitate investment in, in the projects themselves. To develop this amendment, we have been working closely with colleagues at Transport Scotland, the Scottish Roadworks Commissioner, and consulted with wider Roadworks Policy Development Group that includes organisations such as the Society of Chief Operators, uh, sorry, the Society of Chief Officers of Transportation in Scotland, or SCOTS, represented of major utility uh, companies, selected roads authorities and trade bodies such as Streetworks UK. This was essential to ensure that any new statutory undertaker rights were aligned with the existing practices of the roadworks community. In our amendment 121 uh, inserts a new section to the bill, which provides that those license holders with roadworks rights may carry out roadworks. This will include works that involve opening or breaking up a road, opening or breaking up a sewer, drain or a tunnel under a road, tunnelling or boring under a road, and removing or using all earth and materials in or under a road for such purposes of installing heat network apparatus in a road, inspecting, maintaining, adjusting, repairing, altering or renewing heat network apparatus installed in a road, changing the position of heat network apparatus in a road, removing heat network apparatus from a road, or other works which may require such works. Um, this meaning of roads works is consistent with that under Part 4 of the New Roads and Street Works Act 1991, meaning that a license holder with these uh, powers will be a statutory undertaker for the purposes of that part, and license holders will have to comply with the obligations under that part in relation to the carrying out of, of road works. This includes giving the, the, the giving of notice, inclusion of the works in the Roads Works Register, and the application of the Scottish Road Works Commissioner's guidance as well. The amendment also includes provisions in relation to placing any structures for housing any other heat network apparatus on, over or along a road. Additionally, the amendment clarifies procedure for opening or breaking up roads that are not public roads. This provision is modelled on the current practices of electricity utilities and requires a consent from Road Works Authority with the exception of emergency works. I draw to the Committee's attention that powers to carry out road works will be awarded only to certain licence holders who pass relevant additional checks to ensure they are meeting the statutory undertaker obligations, such as being able to reinstate roads to their previous condition. All remaining licence holders will be able to carry out road works by obtaining permission under Section 109 of the New, road, uh, New Roads and Street Works Act 1991. This amendment addresses concerns that were raised during the consultation process, but also by the response to the committee. The Society of Chief Officers of Transportation in Scotland noted, and I quote here, while statutory powers function well for large utility companies, they have been less successful for smaller operators. For example, they are granted to all holders of electricity generator licences, but small wind farm operators are generally not set up to exercise these powers, as they would not only normally install apparatus once, and are better suited to applying for permission from the Roads Authority under Section 109 of the New Roads and Street Works Act. Unquote. In effect, the amendment will limit the number of licence holders that are granted road works powers, as it requires that these rights have to be specified in the licences. We will work with the prospective licensing authority and the Scottish Road Works Commissioner to develop the scrutiny necessary to award such rights via licences to those who wish to obtain them. And this will be necessary to ensure uh, that companies have sufficient financial capacity and knowledge uh, to comply with existing practices of other statutory undertakers in Scotland. We would also like to draw the Committee's attention to the issues of placement of pipework and decommissioning of heat network apparatus in public roads. We have considered these concerns and agreed that these will be best dealt with through subsequent guidance and secondary legislation. Amendment 85 is a consequential amendment to clarify the definition of land in context of the network way leave rights in section 58, and that in this instance, the land uh, does not include the roads. This is deemed unnecessary in light of Amendment 121. So I urge members to support both of my amendments in this group, and I move Amendment 85 in my name. Thank you, Minister. Uh, one question only, I think, as far as committee members from myself on this. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's any consideration to the issue of multiple opening openings up of roads by various companies and whether or not there's something in this uh, in terms of the guidance that will look to try and minimise that from the point of view of environmental waste of resources and indeed disruption to uh, those using the roads and pavements. Yeah, I think I think uh, convener, that's a very important point, and 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 
equally, I think we we all recognise it's very frustrating situations um, that, that that do exist. I understand that is in the uh, Roadworks Commissioner's guidance, but we can certainly look to ensure that that is reflected in any in guidance that's issued in respect of um, the, the 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 application in respect of heat networks. So it's an important point. Uh, I believe that the Roadworks Commissioner already picks this up in guidance, but we'll certainly make sure that's emphasised uh, going forward to reflect the committee's views. Thank you. Do you want to make any further comment on these uh, amendments, or shall we simply move to um, the question? I'm happy to do it right up there, uh, convener, and move on. Thank you very much. Um, the question is that Amendment 85 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. And I would call Amendment 86 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 73. Minister, to move formally. Formally move, convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 86 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call Amendment 87 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 73. Minister, to move formally. I call the move, Convener. Uh, the question is that Amendment 87 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The question is that Section 58 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Uh, we now come to uh, I call amendments 88, 89, uh, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, and 98, all in the name of the minister previously debated. I invite the ministers to move, sorry, the minister to move amendments 88 to 98 on block. I moved on block, convener. Thank you. Uh, does any member object to that being moved on block? No member objects. Uh, the question is that amendments 88 to 98 are agreed. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Uh, the question is that section 59 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call amendment 99 in the name of the minister already debated with amendment 73. Minister to move formally. Formally moved, convener. Thank you. Question is that Amendment 99 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Um, I call Amendment 100 in the name of the Minister already debated. Minister to move formally. Uh, formally, uh, formally moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 100 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The question is that Section 61 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Um, we, I then call Amendments 101, 102, 103, and 104, all in the name of the minister previously debated, and invite the minister to move amendments 101 to 104 en bloc. I formally move, convener. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 101 to 104? There are no objections. The question is, therefore, that amendments 101 to 104 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Um, I now call Amendment 105 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 73. Minister to move formally. Uh, formally moves, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 105 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Um, and the question is that Section 62 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I, I think someone's asking if we've put Section 60 to be agreed. I think we've already agreed that, but for the avoidance of doubt, are we all agreed on Section 60? We are all agreed. I call Amendment 106 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 73. Minister to move formally. Formally moved, convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 106 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Question is that section 63 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call amendment 107 in the name of the minister already debated with amendment 73. Minister to move formally. Uh, formally moved, convener. Thank you. The question is that amendment 107 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call amendment 108 in the name of the minister already debated with amendment 73. Minister to move formally. Formally moved, convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 108 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Uh, the question is that Section 64 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call Amendment 
It's 109-114-116-117 and 1018, sorry, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated, and invite the Minister to move amendments 109 to 118 on block. Uh, moved on block, convener. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 109 to 118? No member objects. Uh, the question is that amendments 109 to 118 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The question is that section 65 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call amendment 119 in the name of the minister already debated with amendment 73. Minister to move formally. Uh, formally moves, convener. The question is that amendment 119 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The question is that section 66 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call amendment 120 in the name of the minister already debated with section, uh, sorry, with amendment 73, minister to move formally. One move, convener. Thank you. The question is that amendment 120 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The question is that section 67 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. I call Amendment 121 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 85. Minister, to move formally, please. Uh, formally moved, Convener. Question is that Amendment 121 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call Amendment 122 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 73. Minister, to move formally. Uh, moved, Convener. Question is that Amendment 122 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call Amendment 123 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 73. Minister to move formally. Uh, formally move, convener. Question is that Amendment 123 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 68 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. And the question is that Section 6, Sections 69 to 76 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed on that as well. Um, I call Amendment 154 now in the name of Morris Golden, already debated with Amendment 141. Morris Golden to move or not move? Moved. Question is that Amendment 154 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I now call Amendment 142 in the name of Mark Ruskell, already debated with Amendment 141. Um, I'm wondering if that's, uh, is Mark Ruskell there to move or not to move? Yes. Uh, formally moved. Formally moved. Um, the question is that Amendment 142 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call Amendment 155 in the name of Morris Golden, already debated with Amendment 141. Morris Golden to move or not move? Moved. Um, the question is that Amendment 155 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not all agreed. Um, this will therefore go to a vote. Um, and The, I will therefore put um, the question to the committee um, of question, Amendment 155. <laughs> um, will all those in favour of Amendment 155 please indicate by raising their hands? So those in favour of Amendment 155 are Graham Simpson, MSP, Morris Golden, MSP, and myself. Uh, and sorry, Alex Rowley, have I missed anyone out? I think it is those four members. Um, all those against Amendment 155? Uh, those are Colin Beatty, Richard Lyle, Willie Coffey, and Gordon MacDonald. 
and the vote is therefore uh, I think tied there are no abstentions so the vote is at this stage uh, yes for no for and therefore I <clears throat> Um, need to use my casting vote, and I will vote in favour of the amendment. So the vote on Amendment 155 is yes, five, no, four. There are no abstentions, and therefore the amendment is agreed to by the committee. I now call Amendment 124 in the name of the Minister. I couldn't quite hear you, Convener, but uh, formally moved if that was there. A slight um, Wi-Fi glitch there. Um, Minister to move Amendment 124 formally. Uh, formally moved, Convener. Thank you, Minister. The question is that Amendment 124 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call Amendment 125 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 9. Minister to move formally. Uh, formally moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 125 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The question then is that section 77 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Um, I call amendment 156 now in the name of Graham Simpson, which is the last grouping in a group on its own. And I would call on Graham Simpson to move and speak to amendment 156. Convener, uh, thank you very much. I shall be very brief. It's a very brief amendment. It's very straightforward. Um, when we pass legislation in this place, uh, we quite often um, do so and uh, um, impose costs onto other other bodies, uh, in this case councils. So this amendment simply says, it's very simple, uh, it says that Scottish ministers must prepare a strategy which sets out the cost to councils in relation to their duties under the Act. Um, I don't. I don't think anyone could possibly disagree with that. Um, it also says that ministers should set out the approach they intend to take to fund councils to fulfil their duties under the Act. So I, I, I think that's entirely right uh, that councils uh, should be given help. If um, if costs are imposed by us passing legislation, so, uh, I see nothing controversial uh, in this. So I'll be moving it. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Uh, no member wishes to speak on it, so I'll come to the minister now. Thank you, convener. Uh, convener, resourcing of local authorities is clearly an important topic and one which we discussed at stage one. Um, the Bill's financial memorandum sets out estimated costs for the regulatory measures the Bill seeks to introduce. Some of the amendments discussed today, such as those in relation to heat network consents, will place additional duties on local authorities, and we will update the financial memorandum after stage two to take a, account of any relevant amendments agreed uh, to today. Uh, the financial memorandum also sets out the Scottish Government's proposed strategy for resourcing local governments. It makes clear the Scottish Government's commitment to funding local government in areas such as heat network zoning, uh, noting that, uh, and I quote here, these costs will be covered by the Scottish ministers, and therefore it is not expected to bring an additional burden to local authorities. Unquote. I acknowledge that uh, the costs set out are estimates, and the exact level of funding and the mechanism for distributing this has not yet been determined. These matters will be subject to discussion with local government colleagues as we develop the regulations to give effect to this new regulatory regime. And I very much uh, remain committed to ensuring appropriate funding is in place. I would also like to remind um, the member, who is uh, no doubt well intentioned in, in moving his amendment, that the Scottish Government has a strong partnership arrangement with local government, um, developing and maintaining a close, constructive partnership between central and local government has always been a priority of this government. 
so that we can respond quickly and positively to the needs of councils and their communities. This partnership also enables us to jointly determine the costs of any new duties and how they would be distributed fairly. The strategy setting out costs uh, and funding arrangements proposed by Graham Simpson's amendment not only duplicates this agreement, but dictates how local government should spend funding provided by the Scottish Government, uh, which runs uh, entirely counter to the spirit of our current partnership. So, convener, I appreciate the reasoning behind this amendment, and, uh, and I do recognise it is well intentioned, and the concern from the member about the sourcing of new duties created by this bill. And I do agree that we need to have that dialogue and to ensure that we get this right. Happy to put on the record my commitment to work with local government partners and to ensure that uh, local authorities are appropriately resourced to deliver these new functions that we are asking them to undertake. However, I do not believe this needs to be put into statute, as it cuts across existing agreements between the Scottish Government and COSLA, and it would bind the hands of a future administration uh, who should uh, feel, be free to determine and work collaboratively with local government and how funding should be allocated. However, to further reassure the member, I would like to note the Scottish Government's support for the general principles of Andy Whiteman's Members' Bill, uh, that is the European Charter of Local Self-Government and Corporation Bill. This bill, if passed, will introduce a duty on Scottish ministers to act compatibly with the Charter Articles. And one of those articles uh, in Section 9, Subsection 2 states that, and I quote here, local authorities' financial resources shall be commensurate with the responsibilities provided for by the Constitution and the law. Unquote. So this all points towards the amendment put forward not being required. As I have set out in line with the resourcing strategy outlined in the financial memorandum, the Scottish Government remains committed to working with colleagues in COSLA and local government to ensure adequate resourcing is in place. However, I believe that the, this amendment is not required, as it will create unnecessary duplication, is not in line with the existing arrangement between Scottish Government and local government, and will bind the hands of any future administration. So, uh, as, as, as such, I am sorry that I cannot uh, be more supportive, and I ask Graeme Simpson not to press Amendment 156. And if it is pressed, I would urge members not to support it for the reasons that I have given. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister. Graham Simpson to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 156. Well, thank you very much, uh, Convener. Um, the Minister, having been so collaborative up to this point, uh, departs from that approach and um, hasn't come up with a single argument against what I'm suggesting here. He talked about existing uh, agreements, uh, agreements uh, which, which are, you know, the, 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 there is some dispute about that. Um, every single year, Cosler and the Scottish Government butt heads over the amount of funding that goes to councils. Um, the, 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 the minister talks about uh, another bill from Andy Whiteman. That bill has not yet become law. That is not an argument against this amendment. If it was law, then perhaps the minister might have a point. But it's not law. It's not been passed. It may well be passed. I hope it is, but it's not gone through yet. So my amendment uh, is very sensible. It merely says what I stated earlier that if we're going to impose costs on councils, we should set out the, the strategy around that and say how we intend to fund them. There's nothing controversial about this, and I'm afraid the minister. Um, uh, he's not even offered to work with me on this unusually. He's done that throughout uh, stage two, uh, but he's not come up with a single argument that I can see uh, against this amendment. So I move amendment 156. Well, let, let us see if this uh, is controversial or not with the committee. Um, uh, I, I, I have to formally ask: Is uh, the question is that Amendment 156 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? We are not all agreed, and therefore uh, I will put this Amendment 156 to a vote. So, would all those members of the committee um, in favour of this amendment please raise their hands? So, in favour are Graham Simpson, Morris Golden, myself, and Alex Rowley. Uh, all those committee members against, please raise their hands. And we have Colin Beatty, Wally Coffey, Richard Lyle, and Gordon MacDonald against. So that is uh, 
yes uh, for the amendment or uh, against the amendment for, in which case I shall exercise my casting vote in favour of the amendment, which gives us five in favour of the amendment, four against, and no abstentions. So the amendment is agreed to. The next question is that section 78 to 80 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call amendment 126 in the name of the minister already debated with amendment nine. Minister to move formally, please. Formally moved, convener. Thank you. The question is that amendment uh, 126 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call amendment 127 in the name of the minister already debated with amendment 67. Minister to move formally. Formally moved, convener. Thank you. The question is that amendment 127 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I now call amendment 143 in the name of Mark Ruskell, already debated with amendment 141. Mark Ruskell to move or not move? Formally moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 143 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call amendment 128 in the name of the minister already debated with amendment 4. Minister to move formally, please. Formally moved, convener. Thank you. The question is that amendment 128 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I call amendment 129 in the name of the minister already debated with amendment 4. Minister to move formally, please. Formally moved, convener. Thank you. The question is that amendment 129 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The question is that section 81 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And the next question is that section 82 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I now call amendments 130, 131. 132 and 133, all in the name of the Minister, previously debated, and invite the Minister to move amendments 130 to 133 on block. Formally moved, convener. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 130 to 133? No member objects. The question is therefore that amendments 130 to 133 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And the question is that section 83 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call now Amendment 144 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 9. Graham Simpson to move or not to move Amendment 144. Not moved. Not moved. Uh, I. The next question is that Amendment 157, sorry, I call Amendment 157 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 9. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. And the question is that Section 84 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Section 85 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And accordingly, that ends stage two consideration of the bill. And the bill will now be reprinted as amended at stage two and will be published on the website at 8.30 a.m. tomorrow. The Parliament has not yet determined when stage three will be held. Members will be informed of that in due course, along with the deadline for lodging stage three amendments. In the meantime, stage three amendments can be lodged with the clerks in the legislation team. So I would now uh, suspend the meeting so that the committee can move into a private session, which will be at uh, 12.30. So we'll have a short break and then we'll move into private session at 12.30. Okay, thank you.